Oh hey, haha. <laughs> in this video, we'll be discussing how the Church Fathers believed in the Filioque. So what is the Filioque? The Filioque is the belief that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. In the last video, we showed theological and scriptural arguments for the Filioque. In this video, we shall show that the Church Fathers both East and West believed in the Filioque. Let's clarify the teachings of the different churches on the eternal hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit. The Eastern Orthodox Church believes the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone. The Catholic position is that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. This means the Father and the Son communicates the divine essence to the Holy Spirit through one common principle of spiration. Concerning the phrase through the Son, the Eastern Orthodox at the Dogmatic Council of Blackerne condemned the Holy Spirit proceeding through the Son to be about hypostatic origin. In the Thomas against Beckos, Canon 4, they say, quote, It does not, however, mean that it subsists through the Son and from the Son, and that it receives its being through him and from him, for this would mean that the Spirit has a Son as cause and source. In Canon 5, they say, For there is no other hypostasis in the Trinity except the Father's, from which the existence and the essence of the consubstantial, the Son and the Holy Spirit, is derived. So, for the Eastern Orthodox, the Holy Spirit cannot be said to receive being, existence, or essence from the Son or through the Son. And such a phrase, according to their own counsels, would make the Son as cause and source of the Holy Spirit. For Catholics, at the Ecumenical Council of Florence, Session 6, they dogmatize that the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son mean the same thing. From the Father and the Son helps us recognize that both Father and Son actively give the divine essence to the Holy Spirit. From the Father through the Son helps us recognize that the Father gives the spirit of power to the Son. So a quick summary is that the Catholics believe that the Holy Spirit receives essence from the Father and the Son, where the Eastern Orthodox believe that the Holy Spirit receives essence from the Father alone. So we shall prove the Filioque by showing that the Church Fathers believe that the Holy Spirit receives essence, being, and existence from the Father and the Son, which is something the Eastern Orthodox cannot affirm. Showing this is sufficient to proving the Filioque. The Church Fathers both East and West unanimously agree on the Filioque. Let's start off with St. Augustine. He's a saint both East and West. He lived from 354 to 430 AD. In Tractate 99 on John chapter 16 verse 13, chapter 4, he writes, quote, Accordingly, he shall not speak of himself, because he is not of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall we speak. He shall hear of him from whom he proceeds. To him hearing is knowing, but knowing is being, as has been discussed above. Because then, he is not of himself, but of him from whom he proceeds, and of whom he has essence, of him he has knowledge. From him, therefore, he has hearing, which is nothing else than knowledge. So we see here that St. Augustine says that, from whom he proceeds, and of whom he has essence, of him he has knowledge. From him, therefore, he has hearing. And this is speaking about John 16, 13. Now let's go to John 16, 13 and see what it says. John chapter 16, verses 13 to 15 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he shall guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Christ says that the Holy Spirit will receive hearing from him. But according to St. Augustine, from whom he has hearing, that same person has knowledge. And if he has knowledge from that person, then he has essence from that person. But if he has essence from that person, then he proceeds from that person. So if the Holy Spirit has hearing from the Son, then he has knowledge from the Son. And that means he has essence from the Son. And therefore he proceeds from the Son. But didn't the Council Blackerne say, There's no other hypostasis in the Trinity except the Father's from which the existence and essence of the consubstantial, the Son and the Holy Spirit, is derived. So clearly, St. Augustine is a filioquist. In On the Holy Trinity, Book 5, Chapter 14, 15, he says, But in their mutual relation to one another in the Trinity itself, if the begetter is a beginning in relation to that which he begets, the Father is a beginning in relation to the Son, because he begets him. It must be admitted that the Father and the Son are a beginning of the Holy Spirit, not two beginnings. But as the Father and the Son are one God and one Creator, and one Lord relatively to the creature, so are they one beginning relatively to the Holy Spirit. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one beginning in respect to the creature, as also one creator and one God." End quote. So first he says that the Father is a beginning in relation to the Son, because he begets him. Clearly this is talking about the eternal hypostatic origin of the Son from the Father, not about energies, not about economy. Now afterwards he says, 
the Father and the Son are beginning of the Holy Spirit, not two beginnings. So this is about eternal hypostatic origin. The Father and the Son are one beginning of the Holy Spirit because they spirate as one common principle, exactly as the Council of Florence says. They are not two principles of the Holy Spirit, but they're one common principle. Two persons with one common principle of spiration. Furthermore, in chapter 9 of Tractate 99, he says, But the Holy Spirit proceeds not from the Father into the Son, and then proceeds from the Son to the work of the creature's sanctification, but he proceeds at the same time from both, although this the Father has given unto the Son, that he should proceed from him also, even as he proceeds from himself. So we see the Holy Spirit proceeds from both Father and Son at the same time, showing that the Father and Son are one common principle of spiration. Furthermore, he clarifies that the Father has given this to the Son, showing that both filioque and perfilium are identical, showing that the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son are identical. Both actively communicate the divine essence to the Holy Spirit, but the Father has given the spirit of power to the Son, which is why the Son also gives the divine essence to the Holy Spirit. This perfectly aligns with the Catholic dogma. Let's move on to St. Hilary of Poitiers. He's a saint both East and West. He lived from 310 to 367 AD. In On the Holy Trinity, Book 2, Chapter 29, he says, Concerning the Holy Spirit, I ought not to be silent, and yet I have no need to speak. Still, for the sake of those who are in ignorance, I cannot refrain. There is no need to speak, because we are bound to confess him proceeding, as he does, from Father and Son. Patre et filio octoribus confitendus. So clearly, St. Hilary is a filioquist. Objection. In Ed Sechensky's book on the filioque, he writes, quote, the problem is that while this text can be understood to mean that we are bound to confess him proceeding as he does from Father and Son, a better reading might be confess him on the evidence of the Father and the Son. Reply to objection. The term that St. Hilary uses is patre et filio octoribus confitendus. In medieval Latin, as opposed to classical Latin, the meaning of octor is usually causer, founder, or originator. Octor is a word used more than a dozen times in On the Trinity. In all of these other usages, it's always using the term to pertain specifically to the fact that the Father is the Son's author or origin. So, St. Hilary thinks that the Holy Spirit has both Father and Son as his octor or his eternal origin because he proceeds from both. So sorry, Dr. Sachensky, but you're wrong. In fact, top Eastern Orthodox apologist Craig Truglia on his blog admits this. In a comment on his blog, he says, John, I agree with your rendering of the Latin personally, which is why I find the passage problematic to the Orthodox. It can certainly be read according to the Roman Catholic view. Granted, Hilary is not clear enough, but I think the simpler explanation, given to the stress he puts on the word octor, is he's talking about the Spirit's origin. We could use mental gymnastics to say that he's really saying something orthodox somehow, but this would not be the simplest explanation. Furthermore, St. Hilary also affirms the filioque elsewhere in the same work. In Book 8, to Chapter 20, he says, Accordingly, he receives from the Son, who is both sent by him and proceeds from the Father. Now I ask whether to receive from the Son is the same thing as to proceed from the Father. But if one believes that there's a difference between receiving from the Son and proceeding from the Father, surely to receive from the Son and to receive from the Father will be regarded as one and the same thing. For our Lord himself says, Because he shall receive of mine and shall declare it unto you. All things whatsoever the Father hath are mine. Therefore I said, he shall receive of mine and declare it unto you. That which he will receive, whether it will be power or excellence or teaching, the Son has said must be received from him. And again, he indicates that this same thing must be received from the Father. For when he says that all things whatsoever the Father hath are his, and that for this cause he declared that it must be received from his own, he teaches also that what is received from the Father is yet received from himself, because all things that the Father hath are his. Such a unity admits no difference, nor does it make any difference from whom that is received, which given by the Father is described as given by the Son. End quote. So, St. Hilary's asking, is proceeding from the Father the same thing as receiving from the Son? His answer is yes, and they'll be regarded as one and the same thing. So, he believes the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and receives from both Father and Son. And St. Hilary's justification for this is John 16, where we see the Holy Spirit receives of Christ because the Father has given him all things. Right? He says, quote, He teaches also that what is received from the Father is yet received from himself, because all things that the Father hath are his. End quote. And so this matches with the argument we made in the previous video, where the Father communicates all to the Son except paternity, the Father spirates, therefore the Son spirates. It's just in the reverse direction. The Holy Spirit receives from both Father and Son, because the Father has given all things to the Son, including the spirit of power. Objection! St. Hilary does not affirm the filioque. His answer was only about reception, as he said, Surely to receive from the Son and to receive from the Father will be regarded as one and the same thing. He was not talking about procession. 
Reply to objection. St. Hilary can interchange receive and proceed because proceeding from the Father and the Son simply means that the Holy Spirit receives the divine essence from both. The same way that saying that the Father generates a Son entails the Son receiving essence from the Father, so the Holy Spirit receiving from both simply means he proceeds from both, or that both Father and Son actively spirate. Furthermore, if you deny this, you have to say that St. Hilary asked a question about procession at first, which he did not at all address in the entire paragraph dedicated to answering that question, which is absurd. Elsewhere, we also see St. Hilary use the perfilium formula, or that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. In On the Trinity, Book 1256, he says, Let me in short adore you, our Father, and your Son together with you. Let me win the favor of your Holy Spirit, who is from you through your only begotten. End quote. So we see St. Hilary agrees with the Council of Florence, where both filioque and perfilium, or the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son, have identical meanings. Remember, he used the filioque formula when he said, we are bound to confess him proceeding as he does from Father and Son. But he also uses the perfilium formula, where he says, your Holy Spirit, who is from you through your only begotten. And so we see St. Hilary completely matches with the Council of Florence, which says, that all were aiming at the same meaning in different words. Those who were saying filioque and those who were saying the Holy Spirit proceeds through the Son were all aiming at the same meaning. So clearly, St. Hilary is a filioquist who's in line with the Council of Florence. Let's see what the great St. Athanasius has to say about the filioque. In his first letter to Serapion, St. Athanasius says, quote, On the other hand, the Son sends the Spirit. For if I go, he says, I will send the paraclete. The Son glorifies the Father, saying, Father, I have glorified you. Whereas the Spirit glorifies the Son, who says, he will glorify me. The Son says, Those things which I have heard from the Father are what I speak to the world. While the Spirit in turn receives from the Son, he will take from what is mine, he says, and declare it to you. The Son came in the name of the Father, whereas the Son also speaks of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Therefore, since the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son that the Son has with respect to the Father, how can the one who calls the Spirit a creature escape the necessity of thinking the same about the Son." End quote. So St. Athanasius acknowledges some things about the Son-to-Father relation. The first thing is that the Son glorifies the Father. The second is that the Son hears from the Father and declares Him. The third is that the Son comes in the name of the Father. And the fourth is that the Father sends the Son. St. Athanasius draws parallels to the Spirit-to-Son relation. He says, The Spirit glorifies the Son. The Spirit hears from the Son and declares Him. The Spirit comes in the name of the Son. And the Son sends the Spirit. So from this parallel, he draws the conclusion that the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son that the Son has with respect to the Father. Now, what is the Son's relation of nature and order to the Father? Well, the Son receives essence or nature from the Father, and he's ordered posterior according to origination to the Father, right? The Father's first person because he's from no one, and the Son is second person because he's from the Father alone. Well, if the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son that the Son has with respect to the Father, what does this mean? It means the Holy Spirit receives essence or nature from the Son, and he's ordered posterior to the Son. And this explains why the Holy Spirit is a third person in the Holy Trinity, because he receives essence from Father and Son, and so he's ordered third. Furthermore, St. Athanasius says, How can one who calls the Spirit a creature escape the necessity of thinking the same about the Son? Clearly, once you understand that St. Athanasius is saying that the Holy Spirit receives essence from the Son, you can understand his argument. If the Spirit receives the same essence of the Son, and if the Spirit's a creature, then you're obligated to say that the Son's a creature because he has the same essence. So clearly, this is not about energies, this is about nature, and this is not about economy. So St. Athanasius is a filioquist. Furthermore, we see St. Athanasius say, First, that if the Spirit knew, much more must the Word know, considered as a Word, from whom the Spirit receives. Discourse 3 against Arians, chapter 28, paragraph 44. Wait a second. So the Spirit receives knowledge from the Son, but knowledge is only received by the communication of the Divine Essence not through the energies, nor by economic procession. And we already debunked the essence-energies distinction. And we showed that Philotheos Kokinos, a Palamite saint, doesn't even believe in the essence-energies real distinction, therefore undermining the basis for eternal manifestation and energetic procession. In the previous video. Go watch the previous video if you want to see more on that. Remember what St. Augustine said, Of whom he has essence, of him he has knowledge, from him therefore he has hearing. But St. Athanasius says that the Holy Spirit receives knowledge from the Son, but that must mean he receives essence from the Son. Therefore, St. Athanasius is a filioquist. This is why St. Athanasius says, For he, as has been said, gives to the Spirit, and whatever the Spirit has, he has from the Word. So everything the Spirit has, he has from the Son? Does the Holy Spirit have essence, existence, and being? Yes or no? If you say no, you are no longer a Trinitarian, and you aren't a Christian anymore. If you say yes, then when St. Athanasius says, 
Whatever the Spirit has, he has from the Word. What does this mean? Well, it means that St. Athanasius is a filioquist because the Holy Spirit has essence, existence, and being from the Word, which is what the Eastern Orthodox Council Blackne dogmatically condemns. When they say in the Thomas Ketzbeckos Canon 5, For there is no other hypostasis in the Trinity except the Father's, from which the existence and the essence of the consubstantial, the Son and the Holy Spirit, is derived. So, it is clear that St. Athanasius is a filioquist. Let's see what St. Leo the Great has to say. He's a saint both East and West, and he lived from 400 to 461 AD. In his letter 15, he says, quote, And so under the first head is shown what unholy views they hold about the Divine Trinity. They affirm that the person of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is one and the same. And if the same God were named now Father, now Son, and now the Holy Ghost, and as if, as he who begot were not one, he who was begotten another, and he who proceeded from both yet another, but an undivided unity must be understood, spoken of under three names indeed, but not consisting of three persons. End quote. So here, St. Leo the Great is dealing with modalist heretics who deny the real distinction between the persons. They think that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one person. And St. Leo corrects them, and he says, The correct doctrine is that there's one who begets, the Father, there's one who's begotten, the Son, and there's one who proceeds from both, the Holy Spirit. So clearly, the context is about the hypostatic properties of the persons, as the Father begetting and the Son being begotten is not about energies, is not about economy, rather that's about hypostatic origin. So the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from both, is about hypostatic origin. Hence, St. Leo the Great is a filioquist. Furthermore, he's talking about how the persons are really distinct. The persons are not really distinct by economy, and they're not really distinct by energies. So clearly, this is about hypostatic origin and hypostatic properties. So St. Leo the Great is a filioquist. St. Gregory of Nyssa is a saint both East and West. He lived from 335 to 395 AD. In his work, Not Three Gods, he says, We do not deny the difference in respect of cause and that which is caused, by which alone we apprehend that one person is distinguished from another. By our belief, that is, that one is the cause and another is of the cause. And again, in that which is of the cause, we recognize another distinction. For one is directly from the first cause, and another by that which is directly from the first cause. So that the attribute of being only begotten abides without doubt in the Son. And the interposition of the Son, while it guards his attribute of being only begotten, does not shut out the Spirit from his relation by way of nature to the Father." End quote. So, we see that St. Gregory of Nyssa affirms that the persons are only distinguished by their relations of opposition. Quote, one is the cause, and another is of the cause. So there is an irreducible distinction of the producing term and the produced term, like we said in our previous video. And from the fact that the relations of opposition are the only reason the persons are differentiated, we see he affirms that the Son is from the Father alone, as he says, quote, For one is directly from the first cause, end quote. And he says that the Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son, where he says, quote, And another by that which is directly from the first cause. Now, what is that which is directly from the first cause? Well, the Son is the one directly from the first cause, meaning the Son is directly from the Father. Now, when he talks about the Holy Spirit, he says, and another by that which is directly from the first cause. But that which is directly from the first cause is the Son. So he's saying the Holy Spirit is from the Son. And clearly, the entire context is about how the Holy Spirit is a unique person. And he's talking about the divine processions or principles or cause. And so he's saying that the Son is a principle or cause, as the Greeks like to say, of the Holy Spirit, meaning St. Gregory affirms the Son actively spirates the Holy Spirit, something the Council of Blackerne dogmatically condemns. This is why he says, quote, And the interposition of the Son, while it guards his attribute of being only begotten, does not shut out the Spirit from his relation by way of nature to the Father, end quote. This simply means that the Son actively spirating the Holy Spirit grounds the real distinction between Son and Spirit. If the persons are only distinct by their relations of opposition, either the Son produces the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit produces the Son, to be really distinct. But the Holy Spirit does not produce the Son, therefore the Son produces the Holy Spirit. And he says that the Spirit is still related by nature to the Father, since he proceeds from both Father and Son, filioque. And the entire context is about the hypostatic differences, and about the divine processions. So this is about the communication of essence. It's not about energetic procession, it's not about economy. Furthermore, he even says that this relation is by way of nature, which the Neopalamites think is really distinct from energies. So no, this is not about energetic procession or eternal manifestation. Now, here's a quick clarification on what we mean by cause when it comes to the Trinity. We do not mean any of the four Aristotelian causes. Rather, it simply means principle or a relation of origin. The divine processions are the timeless communication of the divine essence. Each person is God and is therefore the uncaused cause. We talked about this more in our last video, but I already know that most people won't actually watch that video. <laughs> so, 
I want to make this quick clarification so that you don't just listen to this and get scandalized or come out thinking that the spirit and the word are caused as in created. No, they're not made. They're not created. They're each the same pure act. And pure act's essence is its existence and therefore they're all all say in the essential level. Now going back to St. Gregory of Nyssa, this is why in Against Eunomius, Book 1, Chapter 42, he says, quote, Our account of the Holy Ghost will be the same also. The difference is only in the place assigned in order. For as the Son is bound to the Father, and while deriving existence from Him, is not substantially after Him, so again, the Holy Spirit is in touch with the Only Begotten, who is conceived of as before the Spirit's subsistence, only in the theoretical light of a cause. Extensions in time find no admittance in the eternal life. End quote. So here, he's trying to explain the taxis or the order of persons. Why is the Father the first? Why is the Son the second? And why is the Holy Spirit the third? Well, he says the Son is posterior to the Father, not temporally, but by taxis because he derives existence from him. And the Holy Spirit is in touch with the Only Begotten, who was conceived of as before the Spirit's subsistence, only in the theoretical light of a cause. So the Spirit is conceived of as third person and posterior to the Son, only in light of cause or in light of principle. So that means the Holy Spirit is conceived of as posterior to the Son, according to order of origination, because the Son is a principle or cause of the Holy Spirit, meaning filioque. And this is why, in On the Holy Spirit against the Macedonians, he says, quote, It is as if a man were to see a separate flame burning on three torches, and we will suppose that the third flame is caused by that of the first, being transmitted to the middle, and then kindling the end torch, end quote. So here, St. Gregory of Nyssa is fighting against the Macedonian heretics who deny the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And so he says, conceptualize the Trinity as three torches which possess flames. We will suppose that the third flame is caused by that of the first, being transmitted to the middle, and then kindling the end torch. So in this torch analogy, we see St. Gregory trying to explain the Trinity. The three torches represent the three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The first being the Father, the second being the Son, and the third being the Holy Spirit. Whereas a flame represents the divine essence. Now the context of this entire torch analogy is that he's trying to fight against the Macedonian heretics who deny the divinity of the Holy Spirit. So the communication of the flame in three torches represents the communication of the divine essence because the Holy Spirit is God by possessing the divine essence. So this is not about eternal manifestation or about economy. This is about the communication of the divine essence. So in this analogy, we see that the first torch is a father, and it shows that the father is the monarch of the Godhead. He is the source of the productions. But we see that he says that the third flame is caused by that of the first being transmitted to the middle and then kindling the end torch. So this shows that the father, through the son, communicates the divine essence to the Holy Spirit, showing that the son has an active role in the communication of the essence to the Holy Spirit. And so we see that the monarchy of the Father is maintained, but that the Son plays an active role in communicating the divine essence to the Holy Spirit because the Son receives the spirit of power from the Father. Orthodox who say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone cannot believe that the Son plays any role in the hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit, as the Council of Blackernay dogmatically condemns this. So St. Gregory of Nyssa's teaching can be synthesized with the Council of Florence in light of session 6, but it cannot be synthesized with the Eastern Orthodox Dogmatic Council of Blackernay. So we see that he demonstrates that the Son has a role in the hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit, but this power is communicated from the Father to the Son, and the Father is the sole source of the Godhead still. This is why in On the Holy Spirit against the Macedonians, he says, He, that is the Holy Spirit, ever searches the deep things of God, ever receives from the Son, end quote. The Holy Spirit's always receiving from the Son. This is not about economy, but this is about his eternal hypostatic origin, receiving essence from the Son. Where in Scripture do we see that the Holy Spirit eternally receives from the Son? The only place I know that has any language like this is John 16. And remember, Photius said that John 16 cannot be about the Holy Spirit receiving from the Son. This would mean that the Son spirates the Holy Spirit, which is something he denies. Clearly, St. Gregory of Nyssa is a filioquist. Let's move on to St. Ambrose. He's a saint both east and west, and he lived from 340 to 397 AD. In On the Holy Spirit, Book 1, Chapter 11, 120, he says, quote, Lastly, wisdom so says that she came forth from the mouth of the Most High as not to be external to the Father, but with the Father. For the Word was with God, and not only with God, but also in God. For he says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But neither when he goes forth from the Father does he retire from a place, nor is he separated as a body from a body, nor when he is in the Father is he as if a body enclosed as it were in a body. The Holy Spirit also, when he proceeds from the Father and the Son, is not separated from the Father, nor separated from the Son. For how could he be separated from the Father, who is a spirit of his mouth, which is certainly both a proof of his eternity and expresses the unity of this Godhead, end quote. So we see St. Ambrose starts off by saying that wisdom proceeds from the mouth of the Father, 
quoting Sirach 24.5. Now clearly this is referring to the eternal generation of the Son. And he even says that this is not external to the Father. So this procession is an imminent procession. And didn't St. Ambrose, in exposition of the Christian faith, say, quote, His generation is in relation to a personal attribute. For the wisdom of God saith, I came forth out of the mouth of the Most High. So St. Ambrose clearly thinks that Sirach 24.5 is talking about the eternal generation of the Son, not about energies and not about economy. So the procession of the Holy Spirit from both is in context of the divine processions. And so if the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son and is not separated from the Father nor separated from the Son, this is clearly St. Ambrose expressing his belief in the Filioque. And that's why at the end he says this is proof of his eternity and expresses the unity of this Godhead. The Filioque and the communication of the numerically one divine essence expresses the unity of the Godhead and it's proof of his eternity. So it's not temporal. So clearly this is not about economy or about energies, meaning St. Ambrose is a Filioquist. In the same book, in chapter 11, verse 118, he says, But if you are willing to learn that the Son of God knows all things and has foreknowledge of all, see that those very things which you think to be unknown to the Son, the Holy Spirit received from the Son. He received them, however, through unity of substance, as the Son received from the Father. So St. Ambrose affirms that the Holy Spirit receives knowledge from the Son. And this is an ad intra reception of knowledge by way of the divine essence. So he receives knowledge from the Son through unity of substance, as the Son received from the Father. So this is not about mere consubstantiality, but it's about hypostatic origin. Because the way the Son receives knowledge from the Father through unity of substance is by receiving that divine essence or the divine substance from the Father. And if the Holy Spirit receives that divine knowledge and that divine substance from the Son in the same manner that the Son received from the Father, that's by hypostatic origin. Objection! This is about mere consubstantiality. It just means the Holy Spirit is consubstantial with the Son. Reply to objection. Is the Father consubstantial with the Holy Spirit? Yes. So why doesn't St. Ambrose say the Father receives knowledge from the Holy Spirit? Is the Son consubstantial with the Holy Spirit? Yes. So why doesn't St. Ambrose say the Son receives knowledge from the Holy Spirit? This is because the reception of knowledge is by receiving the divine essence, which is all-knowing. This is not about mere consubstantiality. This is about the communication of the divine essence according to the taxis or the order of origination, right? The Father's from no one, the Son's from the Father alone, so the Son receives all things, including knowledge from the Father, and the Holy Spirit's from the Father and the Son, and that's why he receives knowledge from the Father and Son. And this is why we don't say the Son receives knowledge from the Holy Spirit. This is why we don't say the Father receives knowledge from the Holy Spirit. So, St. Ambrose is a filioquist. St. Cyril of Alexandria is a saint both East and West. He lived from 376 to 444 AD. In his work, The Treasury of the Consubstantial Trinity, Thesis 34, we see him say, quote, It is necessary to confess the Spirit to be from the essence of the Son, for existing from him according to nature. End quote. In the same work, he also says, the Spirit proceeds pro esai from the Father and the Son. Clearly, he is of the divine substance, proceeding pro ion substantially, usiodos, in it and from it. So the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and this explains why he's of the divine substance. So clearly this is about the communication of the divine essence, and he proceeds substantially in it and from it. So clearly this is about the communication of the divine essence, or the eternal hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit, or the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit. It's not about energies, not about economy. Elsewhere, he says, quote, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God the Father as well as of the Son, and comes forth substantially from both. That is, from the Father through the Son. The Holy Spirit comes forth substantially from both, from the Father through the Son. Sounds just like per filium and filioque. Elsewhere, he says, the Spirit is called the Spirit of truth, and Christ is truth. And so he flows forth from him as from God the Father. Thank you, St. Cyril of Alexandria, for affirming that the Holy Spirit, one, has essence and receives existence from the Son, two, proceeds substantially from the Father and the Son, three, comes forth substantially from the Father through the Son, and four, the Holy Spirit flows forth from Christ just like he flows forth from the Father. Objection! Cyril did not teach the Filioque. Read Theodore's letter 171. Dr. Sachensky, in his book, The Filioque, makes his argument. He says, quote, Cyril denied he held this teaching, aka the Filioque, leading Theodoret to confirm the orthodoxy of Cyril's Trinitarian theology, end quote. He says this on page 49. We see J. Dyer's friend use the same argument. This of Theodoret um, questioning Kirill on whether or not he believes in yeah. the, the Father being cause of the Spirit. Right. Explicitly. <laughs> exactly. And Kirill saying no, that would be heresy, and then Theodoric <laughs> confirming his um, orthodoxy. So, we also see David the real man White using the same argument. Saint Kirill of Alexandria and Theodoret, especially if you read Theodoret's 
Epistle uh, 171. Have you read Theodore's letter 171? Theodore makes the claim that, quote, the Holy Spirit is not of the Son, nor derives existence from the Son, but proceeds from the Father, and is properly stated to be of the Son, as being of one substance. So Theodoret is saying that St. Cyril does not believe that the Holy Spirit receives existence from the Son, and he does this based off of the Egyptian letter. Now, what is this Egyptian letter that Theodore of Cyrus is basing his claim on? The Egyptian letter is Cyril's letter to John of Antioch, letter 39. The only time the procession of the Holy Spirit comes up in letter 39 is in the following quote, where he says, quote, but the Spirit himself of God and of the Father, who proceedeth also from him, and is not alien from the Son, according to his essence, End quote. In no way is this either confirming or denying the filioque. Theodore read that into the text. Furthermore, St. Thomas Aquinas did his research. You should too. In De Potentia, question 10, article 4, reply to objection 21, he says, quote, Again, Theodore, in an epistle to John of Antioch, expresses himself as follows. The Holy Spirit does not come from the Son, nor has he his substance from the Son, but he proceeds from the Father. He is called the Spirit of the Son because he is consubstantial with him. Now the above words were attributed by this Theodore to Cyril, as though he had written them in a letter to which he wrote to John of Antioch, and yet they are not to be found there. So St. Thomas Aquinas had to dig through some manuscripts, I believe, in Italy, and he found this. You have access to the entire internet and you could easily search this up, but you still make these arguments, but you've never searched it up yourself. Even scholars who researched St. Cyril in depth conceded that Theodore was wrong. In Father Emery's book, The Trinitarian Theology of St. Thomas Aquinas, in page 279, he says this St. Cyril scholar, quote, has shown that Cyril's formula of reconciliation does not imply any underlying change or recasting of his thought. So we see that Theodore of Cyrus was wrong and read into the text. Now, another argument you always hear is saying that St. Cyril only said, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son using the term proesai, not the term ekpruatai. Therefore, he's talking about eternal manifestation or energetic procession. False. In Epistle 55, we see that he equates proketai and ekpruatai. In Epistle 55, he says, quote, the Holy Spirit is consubstantial with them and he's poured forth proketai. That is, he proceeds ekpruatai as from the fountain of God the Father. So here, he's equating proketai and ekpruatai. So we see that St. Cyril is affirming that the term ekpruatai which the Greek fathers reserved for the Father's hypostatic relation to the Holy Spirit, has the same meaning as proketai. And in fact, I believe that the distinction between ekpruetai and proketai is just the fact that ekpruetai simply means principal causality, or the fact that the Father has aspirative power in an underivative manner, whereas proketai is just talking about generic causality, or active spiration in a generic sense. So both Father and Son actively spirate the Holy Spirit, but only the Father has aspirative power underivatively. And so going back to what St. Cyril says, the Spirit proceeds pro asi from the Father and the Son. Clearly, he's of the divine substance, proceeding pro ion, substantially in it and from it. So clearly, if pro asi and ek pruatai are equated, this is about hypostatic procession. And that explains why he's saying that clearly if the Holy Spirit is actively spirated from the Father and Son, he's of the divine substance. Why? Because both of his hypostatic originators have the divine substance. And that's why he proceeds substantially in it and from it, right? And this fits perfectly with the fact that he says, quote, it is necessary to confess the Spirit to be from the essence of the Son, for existing from him according to nature, which is something the Council of Blackerne explicitly condemns, right? Thomas Beckles Canon 4 says, It does not, however, mean that it subsists through the Son and from the Son, and that it receives its being through him and from him, for this would mean that the Spirit has a Son as cause and source. But that's what St. Cyril says. Therefore, the Spirit has a Son as cause and source. Furthermore, Council Blackerne says, To those who believe and say such things, we cut them off from the membership of the Orthodox, and we banish them from the flock of the Church of God. It's interesting how St. Cyril says that it's necessary to confess this. This parallels what St. Hilary Poitier says when he says, We are bound to confess him, proceeding as he does, from Father and Son. So going back to the proketai ek pruetai distinction, we notice that he equates proketai ek pruetai. However, St. Cyril still reserves the term ek pruetai for the Father, just to show that the Father has aspired to power underivatively, because he uses proketai for both, showing that the spiration itself is identical in Father and Son, and both immediately spirate the Holy Spirit as one common principle. But St. Cyril recognizes the distinction between the power to spirate and the spiration itself. This is the same distinction that St. Hilary Poitiers says. Remember, he says that surely to receive from the Son and to receive from the Father will be regarded as one and the same thing. And he says, such a unity admits no difference nor does it make any difference from whom that is received, which given by the Father is described as given by the Son. So the Father and the Son spirate with the same spiration, meaning the Holy Spirit receives the divine essence from both, and there's no difference in the way he receives it from both, because they spirate as one principle. But the distinction is in the manner of them holding the spirit of power, right? Because the Father has communicated this to the Son. And this is the same distinction that St. Augustine makes. He says, quote, The Father alone is he from whom the Word is born, and from whom the Holy Spirit principally proceeds. And therefore I've added the word principally, because we find that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son also, but the Father gave him this too. 
Okay, so the Holy Spirit principally proceeds from the Father simply means that the Father has aspired of power in an underivative manner, but the Holy Spirit proceeds from both Father and Son at the same time, meaning there's one common principle of aspiration. Is this the same distinction between filioque and perfilium, or the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son versus the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son? And this is another distinction captured in ekpruatai and proesai. The Father and the Son both aspire to the Holy Spirit or both give the divine essence to the Holy Spirit, but the Father has the spirit of power in an underivative manner, whereas the Son receives the spirit of power from the Father. And furthermore, St. Cyril of Alexandria also makes her argument from the previous video, the argument that says, the Father communicates all to the Son except paternity, the Father spirates, therefore the Son spirates. In Tome 4 against Nestorius, he writes, quote, He says, All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore I said unto you, That of mine shall we take, and declare it unto you. For as the Holy Ghost proceedeth out of the Father, being his by nature, in equal wise, is he through the Son himself too, his naturally and consubstantial with him. End quote. Because the Father has given all things to the Son, except for paternity, and because the Father spirates, therefore the Son spirates as well. So St. Cyril of Alexandria is a filioquist. Now there's also good reason to believe St. Bales was taught the filioque. Remember in Against Eunomius 2, he writes, The divinity is common, but the paternity and the filiation are properties, and combining the two elements, the common and the proper, brings about in us the comprehension of the truth. Thus, when we want to speak of an unbegotten light, we think of the Father, and when we want to speak of a begotten light, we conceive the notion of the Son. As light and light, there is no opposition between them, but as begotten and unbegotten, one considers them under the aspect of their opposition. The properties effectively have the character of showing the alterity within the identity of substance. The properties are distinguished from one another by opposing themselves but they do not divide the unity of the substance. We see that St. Bezo clearly shows the distinction of persons is by way of relative opposition, right? The term he uses, translated in Latin, becomes oppositio, the same exact term the scholastics use. And I got that from Eric Yabar's book on the filioque, which you guys should all read, showing that his views of the hypostatic properties are not divorced from the doctrine of relations. Rather, the hypostatic properties are grounded in relations of opposition. And this is why he says there's two modes of predication, common and proper. Under the analysis of substance, or under the analysis of the persons being light and light, they are identical to the same pure act, so there's no distinction. But under the analysis of their relations, unbegotten and begotten, they are really distinct. Clearly, he's teaching that there's identity in substance, and each person is fully the divine essence, but there's a real distinction by relations of opposition, which is why he says, quote, The properties are distinguished from one another by opposing themselves, but they do not divide the unity of the substance, end quote. And so if we accept this theological principle that St. Basil holds, that the persons are really distinct and not composed due to relative opposition, then that means for the Holy Spirit and the Son to be really distinct from one another, there has to be relative opposition. But for them to be relatively opposed, this either means that the Holy Spirit is produced by the Son or the Holy Spirit produces the Son. But clearly, the Holy Spirit does not produce the Son. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is produced by the Son. In other words, the filioque is true. In On the Holy Spirit, chapter 18, he says, quote, So in the case of the divine and uncompounded nature, the union consists in the communion of the Godhead. One, moreover, is the Holy Spirit. And we speak of him singly, conjoined, as he is to the one Father through the one Son, and through himself, completing the adorable and blessed Trinity. End quote. So here St. Basil the Great is first talking about the divine nature and how it's simple, uncompound, but there's still union between the persons in the essence. And then he further says that the Holy Spirit is conjoined to the Father through the Son. So this unity he's talking about, this unity through the Son, is talking about the hypostatic essential level, not on the energetic level and not on the economic level. Now why would the Holy Spirit be conjoined to the Father through the Son? This could only be by way of the communication of the divine essence, or by divine procession, meaning the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, which is why he's united to the Father through the Son. Likewise, in the same work, in chapter 18, he says, quote, The natural goodness and the inherent holiness and the royal dignity extend from the Father through the only begotten to the Spirit. Thus there is both acknowledgement of the hypostases and the true dogma of the monarchy is not lost. So the natural goodness is about the divine essence, because goodness is the essence, and it extends from the Father through the only begotten to the Spirit, showing that the essence is communicated from the Father through the Son to the Spirit, meaning the Son has an active role in the hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit. Now you might say, what if this is about the uncreated energies and about energetic procession? We already debunked that in the previous video. But even St. Basil has something for you. In chapter 19, he says, quote, He is called good as a father is good, 
and he who is begotten of the good is good, and to the Spirit his goodness is essence. So the Spirit's goodness is essence, which means that the divine essence is goodness due to divine simplicity. Well, what does this mean? This means that the natural goodness is not an uncreated energy that's really distinct from the essence. Rather, the natural goodness is the essence. We know that the natural goodness extends from the Father through the only begotten to the Spirit. But if the Spirit's goodness is essence, this simply means that the divine essence is communicated from the Father through the Son to the Spirit, or hypostatic perfilium. And this is exactly why he says the monarchy is not lost. Monarchy of the Father has to do with the sole source of the Father. Because of the hypostatic communication from the Father through the Son to the Spirit, the monarchy of the Father is maintained. So this is not about energies. This is about hypostatic origin. Furthermore, this matches perfectly with the previous quote. The Holy Spirit is conjoined to the one Father through the one Son because of hypostatic origin. Because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, and that's why he's conjoined to the Father through the Son. But didn't the Eastern Orthodox condemn the hypostatic procession through the Son at the Council of Blackernay when they said, It does not, however, mean that it subsists through the Son and from the Son, and that it receives its being through him and from him. For this would mean that the Spirit has the Son as cause and source. But St. Basil the Great is saying the Holy Spirit's hypostatic origination is from the Father through the Son. Therefore, the Spirit has the Son as cause and source, proving that St. Basil the Great holds a Catholic position on the eternal hypostatic origination of the Holy Spirit. But wait a second, didn't one of the ecumenical councils, the Second Council of Constantinople, in Session 1 state, We further declare that we hold fast to the decrees of the four councils, and in every way follow the Holy Fathers, Athanasius, Hilary, Basil, Gregory the Theologian, Gregory of Nyssa, Ambrose, Theophilus, John Chrysostom of Constantinople, Cyril, Augustine, Proclus, Leo, and their writings on the true faith. But didn't Athanasius teach the Filioque when he says, since the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son that the Son has with respect to the Father? And didn't St. Athanasius teach the Filioque when he says, quote, For he, as has been said, gives to the Spirit, and whatever the Spirit has, he has from the Word. End quote. The Spirit has essence, existence, and being. Therefore, the Spirit has essence, existence, and being from the Word. And didn't St. Hilary teach a filioque when he says, We are bound to confess him proceeding as he does from Father and Son. Patre et filio octoribus. And didn't St. Basil the Great in On the Holy Spirit say, quote, The natural goodness and the inherent holiness and the royal dignity extend from the Father through the only begotten to the Spirit. The monarchy is not lost. And in the same work, he says, quote, And to the Spirit, his goodness is essence, end quote. And so the extension of the natural goodness from the Father through the only begotten to the Spirit is the communication of the divine essence, because the Spirit's goodness is essence. And that's why the monarchy is not lost, because the Father is still the sole source in the Godhead, but the Father communicates the divine essence to the Spirit through the Son. And didn't St. Gregory of Nyssa teach the Filioque when he says, It is as if a man were to see a separate flame burning on three torches, And we would suppose that the third flame is caused by that of the first being transmitted to the middle and then kindling the end torch. And then St. Ambrose teaches the Filioque when he says, The Holy Spirit also, when he proceeds from the Father and the Son, is not separated from the Father nor separated from the Son. And then St. Cyril teaches the Filioque when he says, The Spirit proceeds pro esai from the Father and the Son. Clearly he is of the divine substance, proceeding substantially in it and from it. And did not St. Cyril say, quote, It is necessary to confess the Spirit to be from the essence of the Son, for existing from him according to nature. And didn't St. Augustine teach the Filioque in Tractate 99 when he says that the Holy Spirit receives essence from the Son? And didn't St. Leo teach the Filioque when he said that the hypostatic property of the Holy Spirit is that he proceeds from both? So, if we want to follow the Second Council of Constantinople, we should believe in the Filioque. And remember, the Eastern Orthodox cannot synthesize any of these teachings of these fathers, because in the Dogmatic Council of Blackerne, Thomas gets Beckles, Canon 4, they say, It does not, however, mean that it subsists through the Son and from the Son, and that it receives its being through him and from him, for this would mean that the Spirit has the Son as cause and source. But clearly, these fathers taught that the Holy Spirit receives being, existence, and essence from the Son or through the Son. But, according to their dogmatic council, this would mean that the Spirit has the Son as cause and source, therefore confirming the Council of Florence. And no wonder why both John Beckos and Cardinal Bessarion, who are at first anti-unionists who did not believe in the Filioque, came to believe in the Filioque after studying the Church Fathers. John Beckos at Second Leones was studying St. Cyril and St. Epiphanius and a lot of the Greek fathers, and he realized that his position was untenable. Likewise, Cardinal Bessarion was an anti-unionist at the Council of Florence. After studying the fathers, he realized the scholastics were completely right. Don't worry, we have many more church fathers proving the filioque. We're not done yet. St. Ephraim the Syrian is a saint both east and west. He lived from 306 to 373 AD. He says, quote, The father is the begetter, the son the begotten from the bosom of the father, the Holy Spirit, he that proceedeth from the Father and the Son. Clearly this is talking about the hypostatic properties of the persons. 
the father is a begetter and the son is begotten, not by energies, not by economy, but this is about their hypostatic property. So the Holy Spirit being him that proceeds from both father and son is talking about his hypostatic property. In other words, St. Ephraim believes in the filioque. St. Epiphanius is a saint of both East and West, living from 310 to 403 AD. He says, quote, Therefore, he always existed with the Father, and the Spirit always breathed forth from the Father and the Son, end quote. Clearly, this is not about economy, and clearly, this is not about the divine energies, because the term breathe forth or spirate is about hypostatic procession, and this is eternally happening. So, clearly, St. Epiphanius is a filioquist. St. Epiphanius also says, quote, Christ is believed to be from the Father, God from God, and the Spirit to be from Christ, or indeed from both. As Christ says, who proceeds from the Father, John 15, 26, and he shall receive of mine, John 16, 14, end quote. So this is about hypostatic origin, as Christ is God from God, not by the energies, nor by eternal manifestation, nor by economy, but by hypostatic origin. Likewise, the Holy Spirit is God from both, by hypostatic origin. St. Epiphanius used John 16 also to prove the filioque. St. Isidore is a saint of both East and West, who lived from 560 to 636 AD. He says, quote, Between the Son who is born and the Holy Spirit who proceeds is this distinction, that the Son is born from one, the Holy Spirit proceeds from both. Therefore, the Apostle says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. End quote. From Barney's book, The Etymologies of Isidore Seville, page 158. Clearly, once again, this is about hypostatic origin, as the Son is born from one, not by energies, nor by economy, but by hypostatic origin. And so the Holy Spirit proceeds from both, is about hypostatic origin. And furthermore, his justification for this, Romans 8, 9, which says that the Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. This possessive case indicates the relation of origin. The Holy Spirit being a Spirit of Christ is because the Holy Spirit proceeds from Christ. There's a formula called the Faith of Damasus, representing the faith in Gaul around 500 AD, which says, quote, But the Father is he who begot, and the Son is he who is begotten. The Holy Spirit in truth is neither begotten nor unbegotten, neither created nor made, but proceeding from the Father and the Son. Thus showing the predominant teaching in Gaul in 500 AD was the filioque. At the Council of Ephesus 431 AD, St. Cyril writes a letter to Nestorius, in which are these words, quote, For even though the Spirit exists in his own person, and is conceived of by himself, inasmuch as he is the Spirit and not the Son, yet he is not therefore alien from him, for he is called the Spirit of Truth, and Christ is the Truth, and he proceedeth from him, just as from God the Father, end quote. This third letter of Cyril to Nestorius was read at the Council of Ephesus and was approved by the Council itself and by the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th Synods. So clearly at the Council of Ephesus, in Cyril's third letter to Nestorius, we see him affirm that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son in the same manner, showing that they are one common principle of spiration. They spirate with the same spiration, which is exactly what the Council of Florence affirms. Now you might say, well, this is just about economy or just about energies. Well, the quote starts off by saying, for even though the Spirit exists in his own person and is conceived of by himself in as much as he is the Spirit and not the Son, yet is he not therefore alien from him? So this is talking about the hypostatic reality of the Spirit, and he's saying the Spirit is hypostatically not alien from the Son. Why? Because he proceeds from the Son just like he proceeds from the Father. This is not about economy. Economy is not the reason why the persons are not alien from each other. It's not about energies. This is about hypostatic procession from the Father and the Son in the same manner. Filioque. This is affirmed at an ecumenical council. And this is from UnionTheology.org and from Nishant Xavier's article in 1 Peter 5, The Filioque, A Call to the Separated East to Come Home. Now let's move on to the Council of Seleucia Sesiphon in 410 AD. So after the Council of Nicaea, some of the bishops from Nicaea went to the Council of Seleucia Sesiphon in order to spread the Nicene faith to the bishops that were not present. So under the presidency of Isaac and Maruthas and embracing 40 bishops, the confession there framed thus concludes, quote, And we confess the living Holy Spirit, the living Paraclete, who is from the Father and the Son, in one trinity, in one essence, in one will, in harmony with the faith of the 318 bishops which was in the city of Nicaea. And it is our confession and our faith which we have received from our Holy Fathers, end quote. And so this is the West Syriac Recension, and I found this from Robert Sanders' book, The Procession of the Spirit in its Relation to the Division of the Eastern and Western Churches. Okay, so clearly in the West Syriac Recension of the Creed, when it says, The living Holy Spirit, the living Paraclete, who is from the Father and the Son, is not talking about economy. It's not talking about energies. It's talking about hypostatic origin, clearly affirming the filioque. Objection. There are two different recensions from the Council of Seleucia Sesiphon. Look at Wikipedia. Wikipedia asserts that there are two recensions of the Creed from the Council of Seleucia. The East Syriac recension only contains the phrase, quote, and in the Holy Spirit, end quote, while the West Syriac recension contains the phrase, quote, and we confess the living Holy Spirit, the living Paraclete, who is from the Father and the Son, 
end quote. Two reasons why the West Syriac recension is authentic. The first is the presence of archaic phraseology in the West Syriac recension, which matches with the time period of the council. Reason number two, there are phrases which first occur in other texts from 580 onwards in the East Syriac recension, showing that the East Syriac recension is most likely a later recension. And I found these points from Doctrinal Diversity Varieties of Early Christianity in page 282. And so, there's actually good reason to believe in the West Syriac Recension over the East Syriac Recension. And that means that the Latin bishops who were at the Council of Nicaea, who went to share the teachings to Syriac bishops, believed the Filioque was in line with the Nicene Creed and the teachings of the Council Fathers, perfectly matching with the Catholic position. And of course, when it says the Holy Spirit's from the Father, and from the Son, this is about hypostatic origin, what the entire context of the creed is about. The Father generating the Son, that's not about energies, that's not about economy, it's about hypostatic origin. We have the Athanasian Creed. It was composed around the 5th century in France. Most scholars don't believe it's actually by Saint Athanasius, but many Western churches use it in liturgy, and even a lot of saints believe it was actually composed by Saint Athanasius. They upheld it as orthodoxy. In the Athanasian Creed, we see the following said, The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made, nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. Clearly, this is about the hypostatic properties of the persons, right? Not about energies, not about economy. So the Holy Ghost proceeding from Father and Son shows a lot of people in the 5th century and a lot of saints believed in the Filioque. And in fact, Saint Caesarius of Arles is a saint both East and West, living from 470 to 542 AD. And in a sermon that he preached to people, Sermon 3, he actually recites the Athanasian Creed with the part about the Holy Ghost proceeding from the Father and Son, showing that he's a filioquist and that people at his time were filioquists, and he thought that it was completely orthodox. Furthermore, a canon at the beginning of the 6th century imposed a penalty upon any clergy who neglected to learn the Athanasian Creed by heart. And so we see that the Athanasian Creed was something that was thoroughly believed, showing that the filioque was a common doctrine of the Latin Church early on. And this is from Edward Pousset's book On the Closet and the Sun, page 31. In fact, Dr. Suchensky, in his book The Filioque, page 65, says, By the late 6th century, the Filioque achieved a level of acceptance in the West bordering on unanimity. So we see that the Filioque was something that was thoroughly taught by the entire Western Church at this time. So St. Caesarius and most Latin churches believed in the Filioque. The 11th Council of Toledo was held in 675 AD. It was a small local council only attended by 17 bishops. However, the official value of this document consists in the fact that in subsequent centuries, it was kept in highest regard and considered a genuine expression of the Trinitarian faith. At the council, they make the decree that the Holy Spirit, who is the third person in the Trinity, is God, one and equal with God the Father and the Son, of one substance, also of one nature, that he is the spirit of both, not however begotten or created, but proceeding from both. We believe also that this Holy Spirit is neither unbegotten nor begotten, thus if we say unbegotten, we should affirm two fathers, or if begotten, we should be proven to declare two sons. He is said to be the Spirit, however, not only of the Father, but at the same time of the Father and the Son. For neither does he proceed from the Father into the Son, nor does he proceed from the Son to sanctify the creature, but he is shown to have proceeded at the same time from both, because he is acknowledged to be the love or holiness of both. Therefore, we believe that the Holy Spirit was sent by both as the Son was sent by the Father, but he is not considered less than the Father and the Son as the Son on account of the body assumed, testifies that he himself is less than the Father and the Holy Spirit. So what's the significance of this creed? Well, the creed says that the Holy Spirit's procession from Father and the Son is not just economic, but it's hypostatic. Furthermore, it says that the economic processions, how the persons are sent in space and time, reflects the imminent procession, and also shows that the filioque does not make the Son into a father, a common objection you hear from Photians and Neopalamites. Furthermore, it affirms that this does not lead to subordination of the persons. We already proved this in the previous video. At the local council of Hatfield, 680 AD, at the council, they made a formula which said, quote, glorifying God the Father, who is without beginning, and his only begotten Son, begotten of the Father before the worlds, and the Holy Ghost, proceeding ineffably from the Father and the Son, even as those holy apostles, prophets, and doctors, whom we have above mentioned, did declare. And all we, who with Archbishop Theodore, have thus set forth the Catholic faith, thereto subscribe." End quote. From Edward Pousset's book, On the Clause, page 59. So we see that the Council taught that the Holy Spirit has his origination from both Father and Son. Now clearly this is about hypostatic origination, not about energies, not about economy, because the Father being unbegotten and the Son being eternally begotten is not about energies or about economy. It's about hypostatic origin. Furthermore, we see that these guys affirm that the teachings of the previous ecumenical councils and the teachings of the Church Fathers are in line with the Filioque. In fact, they start off their confession by saying, quote, we have expounded the right and orthodox faith as our Lord Jesus Christ incarnate delivered to his apostles who saw him in bodily presence and heard his discourses and delivered the creed of the Holy Fathers and in general all the sacred and universal synods and the whole choir of the Catholic approved doctors of the church have delivered it, end quote. So they say that their beliefs, their confession of faith 
is in line with apostolic succession. This is found in St. Bede's book, Ecclesiastical History of the English People, chapter 17. St. Bede the Venerable and St. Theodore of Tarsus are saints both east and west. So St. Theodore of Tarsus is the one who held this local council of Hatfield. So this saint had this local council where he professed the filioque, and he's a saint of both east and west. And St. Bede the Venerable was reciting this in his book, and he was reciting it joyfully. He said that St. Theodore was combating heresies of his time by his confession, and he said that the bishops there were holy. Furthermore, Pope Agatha Agatha received St. Theodore's confession from the local council of Hatfield with joy, showing that the filioque was something that was thoroughly believed by these saints both east and west, and that they saw no problem with it. And they said that this is also the faith of the fathers. Do the modern Eastern Orthodox affirm this? No, because they're not the true church. So St. Theodore of Tarsus, St. Bede, people at the local council of Hatfield, and Pope Agatha are filioquists. Now let's move on to Patriarch St. Tarsius of Constantinople. He's a saint both east and west living from 730 to 806 AD, at the 7th Ecumenical Council, Nicaea II. He professes in the Nicene Creed that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, using the term ekpruamenon. Clearly, this is about hypostatic origin, as the term ekpruamenon is talking about hypostatic origin. Furthermore, it's in addition to the Nicene Creed, which is not about energies nor about economy. So this is about the Holy Spirit's hypostatic property. He's a saint both east and west at an ecumenical council in the profession of faith saying this, which the Eastern Orthodox Dogmatic Council of Blackernet condemns. Interestingly enough, the Franks were accusing him of heresy for only affirming hypostatic per filium, not filioque. Notice, he's accused of heresy for not adopting the filioque. He's not accused of heresy for taking the position of the Holy Spirit proceeding through the Son. Rather, he was accused for not admitting the filioque. Interestingly enough, for modern Eastern Orthodox, admitting the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, or proceeds from the Father through the Son hypostatically, would anathematize you. So at the Seventh Ecumenical Council, we see that what they're debating is completely inverted to what the modern Eastern Orthodox believe. Now, Pope Hadrian wrote a letter in defense of St. Tarsius, and basically he affirms that both hypostatic perfilium and filioque are asserting the same thing, and both are acceptable. If you want to read this, go to Adam Grove's translation of the letter. And so this matches perfectly with the Council of Florence, which says that all were aiming at the same meaning in different words. Those who say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son hypostatically, and those who say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, whereas the Council of Blackerne rejects both. So clearly, this ecumenical council in the saint both East and West, and Pope Hadrian and the Franks, all point towards the filioque. We even have West Syriac anaphoras that prove the filioque, and use language from John 16. During the liturgy, the priest calls down and invokes the Holy Spirit to consecrate the Eucharist. Scholars believe the Syro-Antiochian liturgy was established before the 5th century schism. Many of these liturgies are attributed to various saints. Now, even if these saints did not establish these liturgies, we know that these liturgies are early and reflect early Christian beliefs at that time. In the Anaphora from the liturgy of St. Pope Sixtus II, 251 AD, we see the following is said, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, and the whole flock and inheritance, and accept and sanctify these oblations by the descent of the Holy Spirit, who from eternity proceeds from thee, and receives from thy son substantially." End quote. Clearly this is not about economy, since this reception and procession is eternal. Furthermore, this is not about energies, because it says, the Holy Spirit receives from the son substantially, which is something that Blackernay condemns. The anaphora of Matthew the Shepherd says, "...send the paraclete, the Spirit of Truth, who everlastingly proceedeth from thee, and receiveth from the Son, what pertaineth to the substance." End quote. The Nafra of Pseudo Clement of Rome says, Send to us from the habitation of thine everlasting kingdom, and from the region of thy lofty presence, thy Holy Spirit, consubstantial with thee and equal in operation, who proceedeth from thee without beginning, through thine only begotten Son. End quote. Clearly, this is about the eternal hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit from the Father through the Son, something that the Council of Blackerne rejects. So, the West Syriac Anaphoras shows that Florence is in line with tradition and not just a papist invention. They equate perfilium and filioque. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son is the same thing as the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, or the Holy Spirit receiving substance from both Father and Son. St. Jacob is an Oriental Orthodox saint and a Catholic saint, living from 451 to 521 AD. He says, Father unbegotten, Son begotten, Spirit proceeding from the Father and receiving from the Son. End quote. This is from Bibliotheca Orientalis Clementino Vaticana, page 302. So the West Syriac Anaphoras and St. Jacob of Sarug hold the Catholic position. St. Fulgentius is a saint both east and west, living from 465 to 527 AD. He says, quote, It is the property of the Father alone that he was not born but begot. It is the property of the Son that he did not beget but was born. It is a property of the Holy Spirit that he neither begot nor was born, but proceeded from the begetter and the begotten. 
end quote. This is from Suchensky's book, The Filioque, page 67. Clearly, this is not about energies or economy. This is about their hypostatic properties. And so the Holy Spirit proceeds from both, meaning St. Fulgentius holds a Catholic position. St. Paulinus of Nola is a saint of both East and West, living from 354 to 431 AD. In Poem 27, he says, quote, The Holy Spirit proceeds from the only begotten Son and the Father, and is himself God coming forth from God, end quote. The Holy Spirit being God coming forth from God is not about energies, nor is it about economy. Rather, this is about hypostatic origin. And this is from the Poems of St. Paulinus, published by Newman Press, page 273. So St. Paulinus holds the Catholic position of the Filioque. St. Eucarius of Lyon is a saint of both East and West, living in 380 to 449 AD. He writes, quote, The Father's unbegotten, the Son begotten, the Holy Spirit neither begotten nor unbegotten, lest if we should say unbegotten, we should seem to speak of two fathers, or if begotten, of two sons, but rather, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son as a sort of concord of the Father and the Son, end quote. Clearly, this is about hypostatic properties once again. And this is from Edward Pousset's book, On the Clause and on the Sun, page 26. So St. Eucarius, a saint both East and West, holds a Catholic position. St. Gregory of Tours is a saint both East and West. In his book, History of the Franks, he says, quote, I believe in one almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Three persons, one substance. The Father unbegotten, the Son begotten, the Holy Spirit neither begotten nor unbegotten, but co-eternal, proceeding from the Father and the Son. End quote. From Pousset's book, page 29. So St. Gregory of Tours is a filioquist. St. Avidus of Vienne is a saint of both East and West, living from 450 to approximately 518 AD. He says, quote, We, for our part, affirm that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. It is the property of the Holy Spirit to proceed from the Father and the Son, end quote. From Eric Ibarra's blog. So St. Avidus of Vienne is a filioquist. St. Odophonsus of Toledo is a saint both East and West, living from 607 to 667 AD. He says, quote, But the Father is from none, but of himself, and he is only the Father. The Son is born of the Father, co-eternal with the Father, and he is only the Son. The Holy Spirit proceeds inseparably from the Father and the Son, and there is only the Holy Spirit, end quote. Clearly, this is about the hypostatic properties of the persons, and he's saying that the Holy Spirit proceeds inseparably from both. Filioque. And isn't St. Ildefonsus of Toledo the one who was greeted by the Blessed Virgin Mary in an apparition, and she gave him priestly vestments? You're telling me this St. Ildefonsus, who was greeted by the Most Holy Theotokos, believed in the Filioque. So clearly, he's not a heretic, and he's venerated both East and West. St. Prosper is a saint both East and West, living from 390 to 455 AD. He is a disciple of St. Augustine, and he compiled a book called The Book of the Sentences of St. Augustine. In column 371, he is quoting St. Augustine's Tractate 99, and he says, quote, The Holy Spirit therefore always hears, because he always knows, and knows and hears, that is, to him that is always to be. But it is always for him to be, to proceed from the Father. But no one can say that the Holy Spirit is not life, since the Father is life, the Son is life. And thus, just as the Father, since he has life in himself, gave also to the Son to have life in him, so he gave him life to proceed from him, just as he proceeds from him. So the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. The life of the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, showing that St. Prosper is a filioquist and in line with St. Augustine. St. Maximus the Confessor is a saint both East and West, living from 580 to 662 AD. In Questions at the Lassium 63, he says, by nature, the Holy Spirit, according to the essence, takes substantially his origin, ek pruamanon, from the Father through the Son who is begotten. Did you hear that? The Holy Spirit, according to the essence, takes substantially his origin, ek pruamanon, from the Father through the Son who is begotten. Didn't the Eastern Orthodox, in the Thomas against Beckles, Canon 4, condemn hypostatic perfilium when they said, It does not, however, mean that it subsists through the Son and from the Son, and that it receives its being through him and from him, for this would mean that the Spirit has a Son as cause and source, end quote. But St. Maximus Confessor says that this is about the communication of essence, and that he substantially takes his origin, ek pruamanon, something about hypostatic origin, from the Father through the Son. So this means that St. Maximus sees the Son as cause and source of the Spirit, meaning he's a filioquist. This is why in his questions at Dubia 34, he says, Just as the mind, i.e. the Father, is cause of the Word, so is he also, cause, of the Spirit through the Word. And just as one cannot say that the Word is of the voice, so too one cannot say that the Son is of the Spirit. End quote. From Sachensky's book, The Filioque, page 78. Now, is the mind the cause of the Word by economy or by energies? Clearly neither. 
This is about hypostatic origin, or the eternal generation of the Son, the mind generating the Word, right? So if the context is about the divine processions, then when St. Maximus says, he also, cause of the Spirit through the Word, means that he's talking about the divine processions, meaning the Father inspires the Spirit through the Word, where the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, hypostatically, meaning St. Maximus affirms the hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit through the Son, which the Eastern Orthodox dogmatically condemn. So St. Maximus the Confessor is a filioquist. Furthermore, in Ambiguum 26, he says, quote, The name of the Father is neither the name of the essence nor a name of the energy, but rather a name of a relationship. And it says how the Father is towards the Son and how the Son is towards the Father. End quote. From Sachensky's book, The Filioque, page 77. In other words, St. Maximus recognizes the persons are constituted by subsistent relations, as the name of the Father is, quote, a name of a relationship, and it says how the Father is towards the Son, and how the Son is towards the Father, end quote. Just like the previous video, we know that the Cappadocian hypostatic properties model of the Trinity is actually read in line with the Augustinian relational model. Anyone who tries to divorce them, aka modern Eastern Orthodox apologists, do not actually understand the Church Fathers or understand Trinitarian theology. And if the persons are constituted by real relations, for them to be really distinct, there needs to be relative opposition. And since the Holy Spirit is really distinct from the Son, either the Son produces the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit produces the Son. And so this conclusion matches perfectly with what St. Maximus says about the Holy Spirit originating from the Father through the Son, therefore grounding relative opposition. So we see that St. Maximus is consistent with the Thomistic doctrine of the Trinity. Objection. But didn't St. Maximus, in his letter to Marinus, claim that the Romans, quote, do not make the Son the cause of the Spirit, for they know that the Father is the one cause of the Son and the Spirit, the one by begetting and the other by procession, but they show the progression through him and thus the unity of essence, end quote. Two things. First, the authenticity of the letter to Marinus is something that's disputed. Now, I know Sachensky in his book tries to argue that the letter to Marinus is actually authentic, and he does this by saying that it's coherent with the body of teachings of St. Maximus. Just because something is coherent doesn't mean it's authentic. I could write something that's coherent with the body of teaching of St. Augustine. That doesn't mean St. Augustine wrote it. Furthermore, there's a principle that says stick to what is clear over what is unclear. And it's clear that his other works, such as Question Ad Thalassium 63, is authentic, and in Questions at Dubia 34 is authentic, where he clearly shows that the Father causes the Spirit through the Word, talking about hypostatic origin, or the spiration of the Spirit. So we should stick with that. And finally, even if the letter to Marinus is authentic, which is something that we don't even know, there's a completely orthodox way to read it. When he says they do not make the Son the cause of the Spirit, he's using the term etias, which meant principal cause. This is why he says they show the progression through him, and thus the unity of the essence. This progression through him is talking about mere active spiration, whereas principal causality is talking about active spiration with aspirative power in an underivative manner. Remember how St. Cyril taught this. Remember how St. Augustine taught this. Remember how St. Hilary Poitiers taught this. When he says, they show the progression through him, and thus the unity of the essence. This matches with their argument that the Father communicates all to the Son except paternity. The Father spirates, therefore the Son spirates. So saying that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son does not give principal causality to the Son because the Son is communicated the spirit of power from the Father. And so the progression of the Holy Spirit from the Father through the Son simply shows that they are united in essence. And because the divine fruitfulness of the imminent will is not exhausted in the generation of the Son, the spiration of the Spirit is communicated to the Son. So although both Father and Son actively spirate the Holy Spirit, because both share the numerically identical spirit of power, only the Father is said to have principal causality because the Father alone has the productive powers in an underivative manner, whereas the Son is communicated the spirit of power because of identity of essence. Now you might ask, doesn't the Holy Spirit also have identity of essence? So why doesn't he spirate or generate as well? Go watch our previous video if that's your question. But in short, we know that the divine fruitfulness of the imminent will is exhausted in the termination or the production of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit receives the divine essence as spirated in his third person. So the divine fruitfulness of the imminent intellect and the imminent will is already exhausted in the production of the word and the spirit. And that's why he doesn't produce any more persons. And so the notional actions are only predicated of one or two, although they are grounded in the vital operations of knowing and willing, which are essential and common to all three. A lot of Eastern Orthodox, like Sachensky and J. Dyer and David the Real Med White, try to explain this progression through the sun as talking about energetic procession. This is false. Clearly, we already showed 
that St. Maximus Confessor says that the Holy Spirit, according to the essence, takes substantially his origin, ek pruamanon, from the Father through the Son who's begotten. So clearly this is about an eternal divine procession through the Son where the Holy Spirit receives his substance and therefore his eternal existence from the Father through the Son, which is something the Council of Black when it condemned. And we already showed that he said that just as the mind is cause of the word, so is he also cause of the Spirit through the word. Talking about the eternal hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit through the word. Not about energies, not about economy. Even if the letter to Marinus is authentic, the body of Maximus's work will actually fit with our doctrine. Whereas the Orthodox cannot synthesize it due to the dogmatic council of Blackernay. Now I heard David the Real Med White in one of his videos say that the Council of Florence uses the term atios when it says the Father and the Son are one cause of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Saint Maximus the Confessor is condemning the very thing asserted at the Council of Florence. He says that they don't believe that the Son causes the Holy Spirit. But this directly contradicts the Council of Florence. So already we could kind of end the video here because the letter to Marinus contradicts the Council of Florence's statement on the Filioque directly. So David the Real Med's White argument goes as follows. One, the Council of Florence says the Son is cause, Atia. Two, the letter to Marinus says the Son is not cause, Atia. Three, therefore if the letter to Marinus is by Saint Maximus the Confessor, he would reject the Council of Florence. Reply to objection. This is a simple word concept fallacy. The way the term cause atia is used in the Council of Florence is different than the way that the letter to Marinus used the term cause or atia. Therefore, there's not a distributed middle term. It's the fallacy of equivocation. Now, this is a simple word concept fallacy because the way they're using the terms are different. The way the Council of Florence uses the term atias here simply means that both actively spirate the Holy Spirit. When they say, the Father and the Son are one cause of the Holy Spirit, they're saying that they both actively spirate the Holy Spirit. Yet the Council of Florence acknowledges that the Father alone is principal cause, meaning the Father alone has a spirative power in an underivative manner. That's why at the Council of Florence they say, quote, And since the Father has through generation given to the only begotten Son everything that belongs to the Father except being Father, the Son has also eternally from the Father, from whom he is eternally born, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, end quote. And so, when the Council of Florence says that the Father and Son are one cause atia of the Holy Spirit, they do not mean that both are principal cause, meaning the Son derives the spirit of power from the Father. In the letter to Marinus, assuming it's written by Saint Maximus, if he's using the term atias, he's simply talking about principal cause or having the spirit of power underivatively. So when he says they do not make the Son the cause atian of the Spirit, for they know that the Father is the one cause. He's simply saying that they do not make the Son the principal cause, because the Father alone has the productive powers in an underivative manner, yet both actively spirate, and there's no contradiction. That's why he says, they show the progression through him, and thus the unity of the essence. So this is a simple word concept fallacy. And furthermore, at the beginning of the letter, he even says he agrees with the Latin Fathers, and he agrees with St. Cyril and his commentary on the Book of John. You mean the Latin Fathers, like Augustine, who say that the Father and the Son are a beginning of the Holy Spirit, not two beginnings. Or like St. Hilary, who says, We are bound to confess him, proceeding as he does from Father and Son. Or St. Leo the Great, who says that the hypostatic property of the Holy Spirit is that he proceeds from both. Or St. Ambrose, who says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son hypostatically. And didn't St. Cyril, on the Gospel according to John, book 11, chapter 1, say, quote, But it is because he is consubstantial with the Son, and divinely proceeds through him. In this way, then, the statement that his Spirit receives something from the Only Begotten is wholly unimpeachable, and cannot be caviled at, for proceeding naturally as his attribute through him, and having all that he has in its entirety, he is said to receive that which he has. End quote. So clearly, if the letter to Marinus is written by St. Maximus, and he says that he agrees with the Latin Fathers and with St. Cyril's commentary on the Gospel according to John, he's not agreeing with you, he's agreeing with us. And so we actually have reason to believe that if the letter Marinus was actually written by St. Maximus, St. Maximus is totally in line with our teaching and not in line with yours. And Cardinal Bessarion at the Council of Florence came to this conclusion as well. He says, quote, but if the teacher, Maximus, says he does not make the Son, but the Father, to be the Spirit's cause, you would not be surprised if you would bear in mind the Greek language and what it is that this language customarily means when it employs this word cause. For plainly, it is the initial and primary cause and fountain and root of each thing, which is chiefly called its cause, and that only the Father exists as such a cause. Who would dispute? End quote. And I saw this from Xavier's PowerPoint slides in his debate against Mumkey on the Filioque. Xavier does very well in that debate. I recommend everyone watches it. So we see Cardinal Bessarion came to the same conclusion we did at the Council of Florence. And this is after him being an anti-unionist who initially rejected the Filioque, but actually after studying the Fathers, he understands that the Latins are right. And so we see 
that the consensus of the church fathers is that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, or the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, hypostatically, meaning the Holy Spirit receives essence from both Father and Son, which is something the Eastern Orthodox dogmatically condemned at the Council of Blackerne, showing that the Catholic position is the true position and the only position that can synthesize the church fathers. Objection. St. John the Damascene says, quote, And we speak also of the Spirit of the Son, not as though proceeding from him, but as proceeding through him from the Father, for the Father alone is cause. An Exposition of the Orthodox Faith, Book 1, Chapter 12. I'm going to follow what St. Thomas Aquinas says and say that St. John the Damascene is just wrong on this. Now, some people say there's a charitable way to read St. John the Damascene and say that when he's using the term to cause, he's once again using a tias, which is true, and he could just be referring to principal causality. But we do say that the Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son. And so that first part is clearly wrong about him saying, Spirit of the Son, not as though proceeding from him but is proceeding through him from the Father. But don't worry. We'll also show that he says stuff that can't be synthesized with their theology either, without further qualifications. So both Eastern Orthodox and Catholics will have to make further qualifications for the Damascene. Because in the same work, Book 1, Chapter 8, he says, The Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son in a manner known to himself, but different from that of generation. Okay, so this procession from the Father through the Son is compared to generation. Generation is a hypostatic procession or a divine procession. So the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son is talking about hypostatic origin. So this is not about energies or about economy or about eternal manifestation. So this still shows that the Son plays a mediating role in the hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit. This is something the Eastern Orthodox cannot affirm according to the Dogmatic Council of Blackerne. And so we actually have good reason to synthesize the Damascene with our interpretation. We're just going to say that he was wrong about Spirit proceeding from the Son because he probably thinks that proceeding from the Son is going to make the Son be an underivative cause. But proceeding from the Father through the Son shows that the Son receives the Father's spirit of power, so the Father alone is principal cause. Argument 5. The Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Now, why is the Son only called Son of the Father and not Son of the Holy Spirit? Because the Son only gets his hypostatic origin from the Father. So when Scripture calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son, it is meant to indicate his hypostatic origin from both Father and Son. Right? Matthew 10.20 says the Spirit of your Father. Matthew 3.16 says the Spirit of God. Romans 8.9 says the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. Galatians 4.6 says God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son. Philippians 1.19 says the Spirit of Jesus Christ. John 15, 26 says the spirit of truth, and Christ is the truth. Objection! The Holy Spirit being the spirit of the Son is just economic, bro. Well, would you be okay with calling the Son the Son of the Spirit? I don't think so. Even if you think that the Spirit sent the Son economically, you would not call the Son the Spirit of the Son. So clearly this is not just about economic procession. Furthermore, we debunked the doctrine of the essence energy distinction in the previous video and show that a Palamite saint didn't even believe in the real distinction between essence and energies, thus undermining the basis for energetic procession. So you can't say that the spirit is the spirit of the sun because of energetic procession, because we debunked that in the previous video. Go watch it. Furthermore, 1 Peter chapter 1 debunks the claim that the spirit is only called the spirit of the sun due to economy. In verses 10 to 11, we see the following, quote, The prophets who prophesied of the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired about this salvation. They inquired what person or time was indicated by the Spirit of Christ within them when predicting the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glory." End quote. So the Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ even prior to the Incarnation, showing that the Spirit is the Spirit of Christ eternally. So the possessive case is not due to economic procession, rather it's due to hypostatic origination. Furthermore, we see many saints also use the same line of reasoning. St. Augustine says, quote, Someone may here inquire whether the Holy Spirit proceeds also from the Son, for the Son is the Son of the Father alone, and the Father is the Father of the Son alone. But the Holy Spirit is not the Spirit of one of them, but of both. And in that same tractate, he affirms that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both. St. Isidore is a saint of both East and West. He makes the same argument. He says, Only the Father is not derived from another, therefore he is called unbegotten. Only the Son is born of the Father, therefore he is called begotten. Only the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, therefore it alone is referred to as the Spirit of both the others. So because the Holy Spirit proceeds hypostatically from the Father and the Son, he's called the Spirit of both. This is also from Barney's Etymologies of Isidore of Seville, page 159. Argument 6. The economy reflects the theology. Before you could understand how economy reflects theology, you need to understand some basic concepts. The first being the inseparable adextra operations. We know that action follows from being, or nature. Nature is the principle of action. Since the divine essence is not a generic universal, the persons possess numerically one divine nature, and the divine persons act through their numerically one nature, and therefore have all common ad extra operations according to the divine nature. 
Now, the second thing we need to know is the mode of action. All actions come from the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit, since it reflects the communication of the divine will, which simply is the divine essence actively considered, due to divine simplicity. Furthermore, this formula is fitting because the Father, who is the source, acts through his word and in his love. Now, let's talk about the doctrine of appropriation. When actions, properties, or titles are common to all three persons, we sometimes specifically attribute them specifically to a single person, to highlight something about their personal characteristics. For example, all three persons are the one true God, but we appropriate the title of God or Creator to the Father because the Father is the source of life in the Godhead, and being the source of life in the Godhead is analogous to being the first principle of creation. We also have the doctrine of the divine sendings, where we see the Father sends the Son, and the Father and Son send the Holy Spirit, and then we also have the doctrine of the divine missions, both visible and invisible, which get kind of complex. But let's start off with the divine sendings. We see the Father is not sent, and sends the Son and the Holy Spirit in salvation history because the Father is unbegotten from no other and he generates the Son and spirates the Spirit. So we see the economic actions reflect the imminent Trinity. Furthermore, the Son is sent from the Father alone because he's generated from the Father alone. And the Holy Spirit is sent from the Father and the Son because he proceeds from both Father and Son. Right, John 20, 21. As the Father sent me, so I send you. John 7, 17. My teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. Matthew 10, 40. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. John 13, 20. Whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. 1 John 4, 9. That God has sent his only begotten Son. 1 John 4, 10. He loved us and sent his Son. 1 John 4, 14. The Father has sent the Son. Galatians 4, 4. God sent forth his Son. John 3, 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world. John 17, 25. O righteous Father, you have sent me. O righteous Father, you sent me. John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. John 17, 18. As you sent me into the world. John 6, 29. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. John 5, 36 to 38. The Father sent me, the Father who sent me, for you do not believe the one he sent. John 6, 57. As the living Father sent me, John 7, 29. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. John 8, 42. For from God I proceeded and came, for I came not of myself, but he sent me. John 10, 36. Whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world. John eleven forty two, That they may believe that you sent me. John 17, 3. This is the eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. John 17, 8. The words which you gave me, that I came forth from you, and they believe that you sent me. John 17, 21. So that the world may believe that you sent me. Acts 3, 20. And he shall send him who hath been preached unto you, Jesus Christ. On and on we see that the Father sends the Son, and this is a central teaching of Christ. Clearly, the Son is sent by the Father to demonstrate that he proceeds from the Father alone. Now we see the Holy Spirit is sent by both the Father and the Son. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. But when the Comforters come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So we see the Holy Spirit is sent by both Father and Son because he proceeds from both Father and Son. And we also have different times when we see the Son pours forth or breathes out the Holy Spirit. In John 20, 21, he says, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he has said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Titus 3, 5 to 6, we see, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. In Acts 2.33 we see, Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. So why does the Son breathe out the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit is eternally breathed forth or spirated by the Son. Why is the Holy Spirit poured forth in economy from the Father through the Son? Because the Father eternally communicates the divine essence to the Holy Spirit through the Son. So the pouring forth of the Holy Spirit through the Son in economy helps reflect the imminent pouring forth of the Holy Spirit through the Son in the imminent Trinity. This matches perfectly with our doctrine of the imminent trinity, where the Father communicates all to the Son, including the spirit of power. So the Son receives the spirit of power, or the promise of the Holy Spirit, and he pours him forth. He breathes him out, or spirates. So what we see in the economy perfectly reflects what we see in the imminent trinity, and it makes perfect sense. There's a perfect logic to it. So even the economic trinity holds the Catholic position. <laughs> Objection! We say that Christ is conceived of the Holy Spirit. Does this mean that Christ is born of the Holy Spirit? No, this is the doctrine of appropriation. We know that all ad extra operations come from one principle, the triune God. But we appropriate certain actions to a single person to highlight their personal characteristics. We know that the Holy Spirit proceeds by way of love, as the love bond between the Father and the Son. Thus it makes sense that the Holy Spirit is said to carry out 
the greatest act of love, the incarnation, right? God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And so the Holy Spirit conceiving Christ is not a proper action of the Holy Spirit, but an appropriation. Now we see saints also making the argument for the filioque by using the economy. Saint Caesarius in Sermon 2.13 says, quote, because the Holy Spirit proceeds from both persons, it is said, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. In another place, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, end quote. So we see Saint Caesarius connecting the filioque to the fact that the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ and to the fact that Christ breathes forth the Holy Spirit in the economy. The economy reveals the imminent trinity. In other words, action manifest being. Saint Fulgentius also says, quote, the Son, therefore, was sent by the Father, not the Father by the Son, because the Son was born of the Father, not the Father by the Son. Similarly, also, the Holy Spirit is said to have been sent by the Father and the Son because he proceeds from the Father and the Son, right? So the Son is sent by the Father because he's generated by the Father. The Holy Spirit is sent by the Father and the Son because he proceeds from both. Clearly, this is about hypostatic origin. And in fact, he also says, quote, In the sacrament of the Incarnation, the Son was sent not only by the Father, but also by the Holy Spirit. Because the man, Christ Jesus, the mediator between God and man, was formed by the operation of the whole Trinity, end quote. So here, we see that St. Fulgentius is saying the same thing. The Holy Spirit is said to conceive Christ, not because Christ is eternally born of the Holy Spirit, but rather this has to do with the doctrine of appropriation. Because the effecting of the incarnation is an operation carried out by all three persons, but we say that the Holy Spirit conceives of Christ due to the doctrine of appropriation. So we're still reading the economy back into the imminent trinity but it's by way of appropriation. The act of the incarnation is the greatest act of love, and because the Holy Spirit proceeds by way of love, he's appropriated the action of the incarnation. Economy still reflects theology. So St. Fulgentius admits our exact points. Economic sendings reflect the imminent processions, and the Holy Spirit conceiving Christ is by appropriation, since it's an operation of the whole trinity. Pope St. Gregory the Great is a saint both East and West, living in 540 to 604 AD. He says, quote, Indeed, it is said of the Son that he is sent by the Father in that he is begotten by the Father. But his, that is the Holy Spirit's, mission is the procession by virtue of which he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Therefore, just as it is said of the Spirit that he is sent insofar as he proceeds, so too can the Son be said without being deceived that he is sent as he is begotten. End quote. So Pope St. Gregory the Great says, that the Son is sent by the Father alone because he's begotten by the Father alone. This is not about energies. Likewise, the Holy Spirit is said to be sent by the Father and the Son because he proceeds from the Father and the Son. And no, this is not energetic procession. This is about hypostatic origination as the Son being begotten of the Father is not an energetic procession. So clearly, Pope St. Gregory the Great is a filioquist, and he's also making the same argument we make. St. Faustus is a saint both East and West, living from approximately 405 to approximately 490 AD. In On the Holy Spirit 1, he says, quote, Thus the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. According to these words, Who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Romans 8, 9. And these, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. John 20, 22. If you want to know what is the difference between the one born and the one that proceeds, it naturally depends on the first being the only Son of the Father, while the second derives its origin from the Father and the Son. End quote. So clearly this is about hypostatic origin, because the Son being born of the Father is about hypostatic origin. So the difference between the Son being born and the Holy Spirit proceeding is that the second derives its origin from the Father and the Son. Filioque. And the reason he deduces this is from the fact that the Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ, and that the Holy Spirit is breathed forth from the Son, showing that economy reveals theology, our very argument. And this is from Eric Ybarra's blog. We see St. Augustine also make this argument in On the Holy Trinity, Book 4, Chapter 20, 28. He says, quote, For as to be born in respect to the Son means to be from the Father, so to be sent in respect to the Son means to be known to be from the Father. And as to be the gift of God in respect to the Holy Spirit means to proceed from the Father, so to be sent is to be known to proceed from the Father. Neither can we say that the Holy Spirit does not also proceed from the Son. For the same Spirit is not without reason said to be the Spirit both of the Father and the Son. So the Son is sent by the Father because he's born of the Father. Hypostatic origin. So the Holy Spirit is sent by both Father and Son because he proceeds from both Father and Son. Hypostatic origin. And that's why he's called the Spirit of both Father and Son. Let's continue. Quote, Nor do I see what else he intended to signify when he breathed on the face of the disciples and said, Receive the Holy Ghost. For that bodily breathing, proceeding from the body with a feeling of bodily touching, was not the substance of the Holy Ghost, but a declaration by a fitting sign that the Holy Spirit proceeds not only from the Father, but also from the Son. For the various of madmen would not say that it was one spirit which he gave when he breathed on them, and another which he sent after his ascension. End quote. 
Clearly, the context is about hypostatic origin being revealed through economy. So when he says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, he's talking about hypostatic origin. And he's making the very same argument. Because the Holy Spirit is sent by both Father and Son in economy, and because the Holy Spirit is breathed forth from the Son, and because the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of the Father and Son, this points towards this hypostatic origin. Filioque. Objection. You said that the sendings reveal the imminent trinity. But doesn't Isaiah 48, 16 and Isaiah 61, 1 and Luke 4, 18 say that the Spirit sends the Son? Reply to objection. I'm going to follow St. Thomas Aquinas here and say that this is to be explained as regards to his human nature by reason of which he was sent to preach by the Holy Ghost. There's no contradiction here. Furthermore, we see that the Latin fathers unanimously agree that the divine sendings in the economy reflect the imminent trinity. Additionally, we could say that the Son being sent is basically an exemplar for us Christians, and the Holy Spirit is the one moving us because movement is analogous to impulse of will, the way the Holy Spirit proceeds. St. Isidore says, In itself, it is God. With regard to us, it is a gift. But the Holy Spirit is forever a gift, handing out the gifts of grace to individuals as it wishes. It imparts the gift of prophecy to whomever it wishes, and it forgives sins for whomever it wishes. For sins are not pardoned without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is appropriately named charity, either because by its nature it joins with those whom it proceeds and shows itself to be one with them, or because it brings it about in us that we remain in God and he in us. End quote. From Barney's The Etymologies of Isidore of Seville, page 158. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is forever a gift. The Holy Spirit is an eternal gift because the Father eternally gives the Son the power to spirate, since he is the perfect image of his very own being, and the Father communicates the spirited power to the Son, and they both spirate with one spiration. And since the Holy Spirit's own hypostatic origin is a gift from the Father and the Son, we call the Holy Spirit himself the eternal perfect gift. And this is also why in the economy of salvation, he plays the role of distributing gifts, distributing the gifts of prophecy, distributing the gifts of grace. This is why he carries out actions of love and charity. Furthermore, whenever people are filled with the Holy Spirit, they do bold, courageous acts or impulses of the will, out of love. This is because the Holy Spirit is the impulse of love between the Father and the Son, their blossom of love, right? And this is why when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, they enter into grace. They are filled with God's love and they start to love God. And now they're capable of carrying out actions of loving God and loving their neighbors. This is why the Holy Spirit is symbolized with the symbol of the dove at the baptismal theophany, because the dove helps us recognize that we are in peace or in bliss, or in a state of love with God. And this is why he symbolized with tongues of fire at Pentecost, because fire represents that divine flame of love, which is how he proceeds. Furthermore, tongues of fire helps us recognize that he is a spirit. He proceeds from the word. And that's why whenever people filled with the Holy Spirit, they confess that Jesus is Lord. They go back to the Son, because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son and returns to the Son. And this is also why he symbolized with water, because water is dynamic, it's vital, and it's transformative. It's a source of life. Likewise, the Holy Spirit is the vital impulse of life. And it's also why he's symbolized by wind, because wind is significative of movement, of impulse, which corresponds to the will. And the Holy Spirit proceeds by way of the imminent will, as the impulse of love. This is why when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, they're able to transform, to change rapidly, because this movement corresponds to the impulsion of the Holy Spirit, the divine impulse of love. The actions in the economy actually help verify the psychological analogy. Saint Gregory of Nyssa says, quote, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Now that which holds this unity together is glory. And no one who looks into the matter will deny that glory means the Holy Spirit. If account is taken of the Lord's words, he says after all, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. For the one who truly gave the disciples glory of this order was the one who said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He who invested himself with humanity received this glory before the cosmos existed, end quote. From Norris's book, Homily 15, Song 6, 1-9. Gregory of Nyssa's homilies on the Song of Songs, page 495-497. So, St. Gregory of Nyssa says, the Holy Spirit is what allows for unity of Father and Son, right? He says, that which holds his unity together is glory, and glory is the Holy Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit allows for unity of Father and Son. Furthermore, the Holy Spirit is given from the Father to the Son, and the Holy Spirit was received by the Son from all eternity, right? He says, he who invested himself with humanity received this glory before the cosmos existed. Christ is the one who invested himself with humanity in the Incarnation. And so he received this glory eternally before the cosmos existed. So the Holy Spirit was received by the Son from all eternity. And therefore, the Son gives the Holy Spirit to the apostles, and that's why he breathed on them. Now, what does this pertain to? Clearly, this is not about economic procession. It says that the Son received the Holy Spirit eternally. So this is not about economic procession. And this is not about energetic procession either. We see that the Holy Spirit is that which holds the unity together. But that which holds the unity together is on the essential hypostatic level, 
not on the energetic level. Energies do not provide the unity of persons. Essence and hypostatic processions do. So, St. Gregory of Nyssa teaches the Filioque and uses it to explain why the Lord Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit in the economy. Now we see St. Irenaeus. He's a saint both east and west, living from 130 to 280. He says, Receiving by the Spirit the image and superscription of the Father and the Son. End quote. St. Gregory the Wonderworker is a saint both east and west, living from 213 to 270 AD. He says, The Holy Spirit is the image of the Son, perfect image of the perfect, life the cause of the living. End quote. Now, I've seen people like David the Rubin White try to say that this actually teaches eternal manifestation because the line before says that the Holy Spirit manifests the presence of the Son. Just because a divine person is manifesting another person does not mean that they teach the doctrine of energetic procession or eternal manifestation. St. Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologica says that the divine persons manifest their hypostatic origin. The Son manifests the Father, and the Holy Spirit manifests the Son and the Father. Does this mean he teaches the doctrine of energetic procession or eternal manifestation? No, that's another simple word concept fallacy. St. John Damascene says, For the Son is the natural image of the Father, unchangeable in everything, like to the Father except that he is begotten, and that he is not the Father. The Father begets, being unbegotten. The Son is begotten and is not the Father. And the Holy Spirit is the image of the Son. End quote on holy images. St. Athanasius says, Moreover, this unction is a breath of the Son, so that he who has the Spirit says, We are sweet Savior of Christ. The seal gives the impress of the Son, so that he who is sealed has the form of Christ. As the Apostle says, My little children, of whom I am again in travail until Christ be formed in you. But if the Spirit is a sweet Savior and form of the Son, it is clear that the Spirit cannot be a creature. For the Son also, being in the form of the Father, is not a creature. End quote. Letter to Serapion 4. So we see the Church Fathers clearly show that the Spirit is the image of the Father and the Son. Now, the Spirit is the image of the Father and the Son because he proceeds from the Father and the Son, and he bears his image. And St. Athanasius compares this to the Son being in the form of the Father because the Son receives essence from the Father. Now this also explains the process of divine filiation, or adoptive sonship, or us becoming sons of God or theosis, or divinization. Because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, he bears his image, insofar as he receives the essence from the Son. That is why, in the economy, the Holy Spirit conforms us to the image of Christ, because he bears the image of Christ. So through grace, from the Holy Spirit, we become Christ-like. And since Christ is the perfect image of the Father, the more we become like Christ, the more we become conformed to the Father. And so that's why the Father is well pleased in us. And so this perfectly matches with the baptismal theophany, where Christ gets baptized, the Father sends the Holy Spirit to rest on the Son, and then he says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased in. This is an image for us Christians. When we get baptized, we get filled with the Holy Spirit. And because we get filled with the Holy Spirit, we become adoptive sons of God because the Holy Spirit is the image of the Son. And the Son is the natural Son of God. And because he's the natural image of the Father, we become more like the Father. And so the economy and the divine missions communicate the deep mysteries of the inner Trinitarian life. So even the process of theosis, even the process of divinization, points towards the filioque. Now, if you want to learn more about adoptive sonship and divine filiation, read Blessed Columba Marmion. Many say that he's going to become a doctor of the church, the doctor of adoptive filiation. And now we're going to talk about some more biblical parallels. Now, we talked about this in our previous video, but the audio was really bad, so I'm going to redo some of this. Remember that the Father gives all authority to the Son. In Matthew 28, 18, we see, quote, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. End quote. In Matthew 11, 27, we see, quote, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, end quote. The Son's reception of authority from the Father indicates that he receives the divine essence or has his hypostatic origin from the Father. St. John Chrysostom says, quote, All authority hath been given unto me by my Father, referring all to him that begat him, not as though of himself he were not sufficient, but to signify that he is a son and not unbegotten, end quote. Homily 39 on 1 Corinthians paragraph 11. So according to St. John Chrysostom, the Son's reception of authority is to show something about his hypostatic origin and personal properties. St. Athanasius says, quote, He was said, was given unto me, and I received, and were delivered to me, only to show that he is not the Father, but the Father's Word, and the Eternal Son, who because of his likeness to the Father, has eternally what he has from him, and because he is a Son, has from the Father what he has eternally. End quote. Discourse 3 against Arians chapter 27. Likewise, St. Athanasius says the Son's reception of authority reflects his hypostatic origin from the Father, since he's the eternal word of the Father. Now, John 16, 13 parallels John 5, 19 and John 12, 49. John 16, 13 says, quote, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he, that is the Holy Spirit, will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. John 5, 19 says, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing, 
because whatever the Father does, the Son also does, end quote. And John 12, 49 says, quote, For I have not spoken on my own authority. The Father who sent me has himself given me commandment, what to say and what to speak, end quote. So we see both Son and Spirit do not speak on their own authority, right? The Holy Spirit will not speak on his authority, John 16, 13. John 5, 19 says, The Son can do nothing by himself. And John 12, 49 says, I, that is the Son, have not spoken on my own authority. But they both receive it from another. In John 16, 13, we see, But whatever he hears, he will speak. Meaning the Holy Spirit will speak what he hears. And in John 5, 19, we see, He, that is the Son, can do only what he sees his Father doing. And in John 12, 49, we see, The Father who sent me has himself given me commandment what to say and what to speak. And also in John 8, 28, we see the same. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak thus as the Father taught me. The reception of authority points to the reception of the divine essence or hypostatic origin. The Son receives authority and his speech from the Father since he has his hypostatic origin from the Father. St. Augustine on John 5, 19 says, quote, The Father then shows a thing which he does to the Son in such wise that the Son sees all things in the Father and is all things in the Father. For by seeing he was begotten and by being begotten he sees, end quote. Tractate 21, 4. So St. Augustine says, the Son does whatever he sees the Father doing because the Son is begotten of the Father. So this quasi-dependency of sight is based on hypostatic origin. St. Hilary on John 5.19 says, quote, The next words are, For whatever things he, the Father, does, these also does the Son likewise. This likewise is added to indicate his birth whatsoever and same to indicate the true divinity of his nature. End quote on the Trinity Book 718. Likewise, St. Hilary indicates the Son doing only what he sees a Father doing, indicates that he's begotten of the Father, born of the Father, not about energies, not about economy. St. Cyril of Alexandria on John 8:28 says, quote, Thus therefore does the only begotten himself here to affirm that he learned of the Father, for what he knows that he is because of the Father from whom he is, for he is light of light. This he said, that he learnt of him, having a sort of untaught learning of God-befitting works and words from the own nature of him who begat him." End quote. Commentary on John 8.28 So, according to St. Cyril of Alexandria, the Son learning from the Father indicates the Son received the all-knowing essence from the Father, which is why he says, having a sort of untaught learning of God-befitting works and words from the own nature of him who begat him. He says untaught learning because clearly the Son is omniscient from all eternity, by way of receiving the omniscient essence from the Father. So clearly, it's thoroughly patristic that the reception of authority and of action and of knowledge points towards the reception of the divine essence or hypostatic origin, meaning the Son receives authority and his speech from the Father since he has his hypostatic origin from the Father. What does this mean then? John 16, 13 to 14, we see, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the Spirit does not speak on his own authority, but speaks what is received from the Son. That is just to say that the Spirit receives authority from the Son, since he's communicated the divine essence from the Father and the Son. Furthermore, the justification for this is that all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said he would take what is mine. The therefore emphasizes how the Father giving all things to the Son is a justification or explanation why the Holy Spirit receives from the Son. That is to say, the only reason the Holy Spirit receives from the Son is because the Father has given all things, including spiration, to the Son. And so the argument from the previous video is thoroughly proved by John 16, the Church Fathers, and by making connections in Scripture. Premise 1, the Father communicates all to the Son except paternity, right? And that's proved in John 16, 15, where all that the Father has is mine. Premise 2, the Father spirates. That's something that everyone agrees with. Conclusion, therefore the Son spirates. And this is why we see that the Holy Spirit will take what is the Son's. And remember in the previous video, we addressed Photius, one of the, quote, protectors of orthodoxy and great saints of Eastern Orthodoxy, and his objection, saying that John 16 is not about the Holy Spirit receiving from the Son. In the Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit, Book 222, he says, quote, What other hypostasis from whom the Spirit is said to receive could be meant other than the Father? Because it cannot be as has been recently contended against God, that he receives from the Son. So clearly Photius does not believe that John 16 affirms that the Holy Spirit receives from the Son because this would imply the filioque for him. The only problem is that in the previous video we showed that St. Epiphanius, St. Hilary, St. Ambrose, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Athanasius, St. Leo, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, St. Cyril of Alexandria all believe that John 16 shows that the Holy Spirit receives from the Son. 
And in this video, we also show that St. Augustine and some others do as well. Now, it's funny that Neo-Palamites now try to explain John 16 using eternal manifestation or energetic procession, the doctrine of these uncreated energies that are really distinct from God's nature being received by the Holy Spirit from the Son. Clearly, this is indicating evolution of dogma because Photius the Great said that John 16 cannot be about the Holy Spirit receiving from the Son because he had no idea about the doctrine of energetic procession. And we debunked the essence energies real distinction in the previous video and therefore undermined the doctrine of of energetic procession. We show that it either leads to composition in the Godhead or that you're, you're going to have to reject the neo palamite commitments of saying that the divine energies are fully uncreated and fully God. Remember we answered the, the common objection that distinction does not entail division or composition and show that there's faulty logic at play. We're not going to go over it again. Just watch the previous video if you want to see the justification. And we showed that Philotheos Kokinos, a palamite saint, said that the essence energies distinction is not a real distinction. He says, quote, According to the theologians and the fathers, the divine essence and the divine energy are two things in the sense that it is proclaimed that they differ from each other not really, but conceptually, and that these two things are one thing, the unity in its turn being taken and proclaimed as existent, not conceptually, but really. And so, clearly, the entire doctrine of energetic procession has been debunked in our previous video. Therefore, you cannot use energetic procession to explain John 16 or the reception of authority or any of the biblical parallels we made before. Objection. The Bible only says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Read John 15, 26. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth ekpruetai from the Father, he shall testify of me. Catholicism debunked. If only it was that easy. This is like sola scriptura level logic. Look, 2 Timothy 3, 16 says all scriptures God breathe. Therefore, sola scriptura is right. Proving a shared belief does not refute a position. Protestants believe that scripture alone is infallible. Catholics and Orthodox believe that scripture is infallible and that the magisterium is infallible. Claiming scripture is infallible does not prove Protestantism. All Christians believe that scripture is infallible. The status of whether or not the magisterium is infallible determines which position is correct. Here's an example of the faulty logic used in this argument. You claim Bob is only wearing a blue shirt. I claim Bob is wearing a blue shirt and blue pants. If I said Bob is wearing a blue shirt, that does not prove either claim. Both claims affirm it. It could be the case that Bob is wearing a blue shirt and blue pants, and it could be the case that Bob is wearing a blue shirt and black pants. Either claim could be true. You must demonstrate the pants is blue or not blue to determine which claim is right. Likewise, Eastern Orthodox believe the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone, whereas Catholics believe the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. John 15, 26 says, The Spirit of Truth which proceedeth from the Father. Both positions affirm this. This does not refute or prove either position. To prove the Eastern Orthodox position, you must show either the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone, or the Holy Spirit does not proceed from the Son. Showing a passage from Scripture saying that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father does not disprove the Catholic position. Showing a passage from a church father that says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father does not disprove the Filioque. Both positions affirm this. Well, okay, you're right, but there's no evidence that the Holy Spirit also proceeds from the Son. Therefore, no one should believe it. There's only evidence for the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father. So we should only affirm that. We already showed all the evidence from the Church Fathers and from Scripture as well. So this objection is wrong. But let's move on to Revelation 22.1. Revelation 22.1 says, quote, And he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So the river of water of life proceeds from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now what is the river of water of life? John 7, 38-39 says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit. So the rivers of living water is the Holy Spirit. Now who is the Lamb? John 1, says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God. So Jesus, Son of God, is the Lamb of God. Now going back to Revelation 22, 1, which says, And he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now what does this mean? Well, the river of water of life proceeds from the throne of God and of the Lamb. But the river of water of life is the Holy Spirit, and the Lamb is the Son. So this translates into the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. Objection! This is talking about economic temporal procession, not about hypostatic procession. Well, the term for proceeding used in Revelation 22.1 is ekpruamenon. The term ekpruamenon, when used in context of multiple divine persons, is about theology proper, according to Eastern Orthodox. Meaning this verse should be read as regarding hypostatic origin. If you reject this fact, then you also undermine your basis for reading John 15.26 as hypostatic. 
since you could just say the term used in John 15, 26 is regarding economic procession. Furthermore, the usage of ek pruamanon in Revelation 22:1 perfectly matches the Greek Nicene Creed phrase for proceeds, ek pruamanon. The term used in John 15, 26 is the same word, but in a different case than that of the Nicene Creed, ek pruatai. Right? The Greek Nicene Creed says ek tu patros ek pruamanon. Revelation 22:1 says ek pruamanon ek tu. So in God's divine foreknowledge, he even vindicated the Filioque by inspiring the Holy Fathers of Nicaea to use the term that best matches the true procession of the Holy Spirit, ek pruamanon, absolutely vindicating the Filioque. Now the question is, is ek pruamanon hypostatic or not? If you say yes, then Revelation 22.1 proves the Filioque. If you say no, now your objection from John 15.26 is now undermined, because it could just be about economy. But that means both John 15.26 and Revelation 22.1 are economic processions. And now the only way to know the imminent trinity is by the economy then. <laughs> Therefore, the economy reflects the imminent trinity, showing that the filioque is still true. So whatever your interpretation is, you're going to be led to the filioque. <laughs> All roads lead to Rome. Let's grant that Revelation 22 is an economic procession. This would still point to the Filioque, and it actually points towards the Filioque as defined at the Council of Florence. Remember, action manifests being. The divine actions in time and space help manifest the inner life of the Godhead. And so the Holy Spirit proceeding from both Father and Son in economy reflects the fact that he proceeds from both Father and Son in theology. All right, fine, I'll grant you that, but it still says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the throne, not from the persons. Time to understand basic symbology. The throne represents the one shared authority the Father gives to the Son, not merely a physical throne, although in John's vision there might have been a physical throne to communicate the uncreated reality. But revealing the uncreated reality is the intent behind the physical reality in the vision if there was a physical throne, right? Mark 14.62 says, And Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Sitting on the right hand of power is symbolic of the co-equality of the Father and the Son. Likewise, the throne is symbolic of the shared authority of Father and Son. So proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb is trying to communicate that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the shared spirit of power of the Father and the Son. Notice how it says proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb and not the thrones. This proves there's one common source of the procession, one throne. Yet this one source is from two persons, Father and Son. This perfectly matches with the Ecumenical Council of Florence, how there's one common principle of inspiration, Father and Son, not two principles. So going back to Revelation 22.1, And he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Revelation 22.1 says, The Holy Spirit proceeds from one source, one throne. The Council of Florence says, the Holy Spirit proceeds from one source, one common inspiration. Revelation 22.1 says, The Holy Spirit proceeds from two persons, God and Lamb. The Council of Florence says, The Holy Spirit proceeds from two persons, Father and Son. Revelation 22.1 is trying to reveal a truth about the imminent trinity. The term ek pruamanon is used. And even if you don't think it's about hypostatic origin, economy still reveals theology. The Council of Florence is talking about hypostatic origin, filioque. Revelation 22.1 shows that the monarchy of the Father is maintained. The throne is of God and of the Lamb. It's the Father's throne first and foremost but he shares it with the Lamb. At the Council of Florence, the monarchy of the Father is maintained. The spire of power is the Father's underivatively, yet he communicates it to the Son, who has it derivatively. So we see Revelation 22.1 perfectly matches with the Council of Florence. This is not a mere coincidence that God-breathed scriptures match perfectly with the doctrine as defined at the Council of Florence. Christ established a Catholic Church on St. Peter and gave him the keys of the kingdom. The filioque was bound on earth and and remember, St. Maximus the Confessor says the Apostolic Sea, aka the Sea of Rome, which from God the Incarnate Word himself, as well as all the Holy Councils, according to the sacred canons and definitions, has received and possesses supreme power in all things and for all things over all the Holy Churches of God throughout the world, as well as power and authority of binding and loosing. Clearly, the Council of Florence matches perfectly with Revelation 22.1 because the Apostolic Sea, the Sea of Rome, has supreme power and has bound it in heaven and on earth. And this is why the Greek Nicene Creed uses the exact same term, ek pruamanon, as we see in Revelation 22.1, proving the filioque is true. Remember in our previous video, we talked about the taxis or the order of persons. In Matthew 28.19, we see, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. We see that the Father is the first person, the Son is the second person, and the Holy Spirit is the third person in the Godhead. We know that all three persons are co-eternal and logically simultaneous, so there's no prior or posterior between the persons in a temporal sense. However, we still have an ordering of the persons according to the traditional baptismal formula. We believe that the ordering of the persons is best explained by the order of hypostatic origination, which is best expressed by the filioque. The Eastern Orthodox also teach the ordering of the persons, as Mathoma has demonstrated elsewhere. Side note. 
Go watch Mathoma's theology series to understand divine simplicity. It's also taught in Metropolitan's Philaret's Catechism. Philaret is considered a saint by the Eastern Orthodox, and Wikipedia says that he's the most influential figure in the Russian Orthodox Church for more than 40 years. In Philaret's Catechism, question 75, he says, The first person of the Holy Trinity, God the Father. The second person of the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ the Son. The third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Ghost. Saint Basil and others also affirm the taxis of persons. Saint Basil in On the Holy Spirit 17 says, As therefore the Son stands in relation to the Father, so the Spirit stands in relation to the Son, according to the ordering of the traditional baptismal formula. But if the Spirit is ordered to the Son and the Son to the Father, it is evident that the Spirit is also ordered to the Father. End quote. So the Father is the first, the Son is the second, and the Holy Spirit is the third. Now let's compare the explanatory power of the different models. The Eastern Orthodox model is that the Son and the Holy Spirit proceed both from the Father alone. So if the Son and the Holy Spirit have hypostatic origination from the Father alone, why is the Son the second person in the Godhead and the Holy Spirit the third person? Is it just some contingent accident? Could the Son be the third person? There seems to be no logical necessity for the taxis or the order of the persons. Objection! Eternal manifestation explains the order of persons. Reply to objection. We already answered and debunked eternal manifestation. Furthermore, eternal manifestation doesn't actually explain the taxis of the persons, and it doesn't ground it in anything. It just presupposes the taxis of persons, as the communication of the energy from the Father through the Son to the Spirit doesn't explain why that is the case. The Catholic model actually explains the taxis of the persons. Under the Filioque, it makes sense that the Son is the second person and the Holy Spirit is the third person. This is because the Father's from no one, so he's first. The Son is from the Father alone, so he's second. The Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son, so he's third. So there's a logical necessity for the taxis of the persons. And so we see that the Catholic model of the Trinity has greater explanatory power than the Eastern Orthodox model of the Trinity to explain the order of the persons. Remember, to speak of the Father spirating the Holy Spirit already assumes the Father generates. Because the Father is truly a Father because he's a Father of one who's unique, namely the Only Begotten. So to speak of the Father spirating the Holy Spirit means the Father's already Father. But the condition of fatherhood is grounded in generating the Son, showing that the origination of the Son is ordered prior to the Holy Spirit, not temporally, but by priority of origination according to taxis. And therefore, the Son receives all that the Father has, including the spirit of power, because the divine fecundity of the imminent will is not exhausted in the generation of the Word, and therefore the Father and the Word spirate with one common spiration. And because the Holy Spirit receives the divine essence as third person and aspirated, the divine fecundity of the imminent intellection and of the imminent will is already exhausted. Therefore, he produces no further persons. Now, there are definitely more arguments for the filioque. There's definitely more patristic evidence, but I'm getting tired. So I'm going to make final argument, and that's the argument of the beauty of the filioque. So beauty involves harmony, a synthesis of various truths, and elements of surprise and simplicity. The filioque is beautiful because it surprisingly and simply synthesizes many insights in various domains, including the human person, theology, and philosophy. Now, the filioque matches well with speculative theology. More on the beauty of the filioque. How it illuminates the first human family. The first human person was Adam, and he originated from no prior human person. He did not derive his personhood from a previous human person. This is a reflection of how the Father is the first person in the Godhead and how he's unoriginate. In Genesis 2.22, we see the following, quote, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man be made into a woman and brought her to the man. So Eve, the second human person, originated or proceeded from the side of one person, of Adam. This is a reflection of how the son, the second person, is generated or proceeds from the father, the first person, and he's in the bosom of the father. The third human person, Cain, originated from the first two persons, Adam and Eve, and he was their love product. Now some church fathers use Seth instead, but still, we know Cain's third, so either one works. And this is a reflection of how the Holy Spirit, the third person, originates from both the Father and the Son, and he's our love blossom. So the filioque even makes sense of the creation and origin of the human persons, and shows how creation is an intentional icon of the triune God. Genesis even points towards the filioque and the Catholic Church. Now the following are some insights and connections I had in contemplation and drawing connections between different things I've read. If any of the following is erroneous, or not in line with the Church teaching, I withhold my views and submit to Holy Mother Church. The first one is the golden chain, the beauty of the filioque, based off of giving and receiving. The Father is fully active in communicating the divine essence to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. He's fully giving. He gives the divine essence to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. The Son is active in communicating the divine essence to the Holy Spirit, and he's receptive in receiving the divine essence from the Father. So the Son is giving and receiving, and the Holy Spirit is fully receptive and receives the divine essence from the Father and the Son, but produces no further person so he's fully receiving. So there's a golden chain in the Trinity. The divine persons logically enumerate all combinations of giving and receiving. The Father fully active, the Son active and receptive, and the Holy Spirit fully receptive. Now we have to keep in mind that receptivity is not the same thing as passivity. Each person is pure act, 
and therefore they have no passive potency. But the produced persons, the word and the spirit, are receptive of pure act. So from the filioque, there's a perfect harmony in the trinity. And we realize that even if there could have been other divine productions, which there can't since they're based off of the two spiritual operations, it would lead to an extraneous product, either a fully receptive person or an active and receptive person, both which we already have. The beauty of the filioque, how it illuminates the human family. In the family, we have father, mother, and child. Fathers actively have full authority over the family. In Ephesians 5.23, we see, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. The father in the family, being fully active, mirrors God the Father being fully active in communicating the divine essence. Now, wives are to be receptive and submissive to their husbands, but they have active authority over the children. In Ephesians 5.22, we see, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, as you do to the Lord. In Proverbs 1.8, we see, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and reject not your mother's teaching. So the mother being active and receptive in the family mirrors God the Son being active and receptive. He receives the divine essence from the Father, and he actively communicates the divine essence to the Holy Spirit. Now in the family, children are to be fully receptive and obedient to their parents. In Colossians 3.20, we see, children, obey your parents. In 1 Timothy 3, we see, he must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. A child being fully receptive mirrors how God the Holy Spirit is fully receptive of the divine essence as he receives it from both father and son. And so we see the active receptive structure of the family is that the father is fully active, the mother is active and receptive, and the child is fully receptive. And we see that this active receptive structure mirrors the active receptive structure of the Godhead and of the communication of the divine essence. The father is fully active in giving the divine essence to the son and to the spirit. The son is active and receptive. He receives the divine essence from the Father, and he gives the divine essence to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is fully receptive. He receives the divine essence from both Father and Son. And so we see the active receptive structure in the family is actually a perfection because it imitates the active receptive structure of the Godhead under the analysis of the filioque. Now before you accuse me of heresy, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Clearly in the Godhead, there's total equality of authority. We are not asserting that there's an inequality of authority in the Trinity. Rather, we're using the active receptive structure of the communication of the divine essence to illuminate the active receptive authority structure of the created human family. So the Trinity shows us that the family structure is actually perfection rather than imperfection. Although there's an imperfection according to authority, there's a perfection according to active receptive structure. And since the family is patterned off of the triune God, there's a fittingness when the members of the family fulfill their role. Hence, the Bible advocates for wives to submit to their husbands and children to listen to their parents. In fact, the fourth commandment makes sense because children obeying their parents analogously imitates the receptivity of the Holy Spirit. This shows how the moral law is grounded in the inner life of the Godhead and not arbitrary or subjective, but it's a reflection of the triune God himself. Think about the Euthyphro dilemma and how morality is not something that's merely subjective or purely arbitrary. Rather, it's objective and intrinsic to God. And the fourth commandment makes more sense in light of the active receptive structure granted by the filioque. Furthermore, we see a similar active receptive structure in the church. There are three states of the church. The church triumphant, those in heaven experiencing the beatific vision, the church militant, those on earth, and the church suffering, those in purgatory. Now the church triumphant are fully active in their prayers. They're constantly praising God, fully praying for the entire church. Now the church militant, us on earth, we're active and receptive. We pray for those in purgatory, but we also receive prayers from those in heaven, those experiencing the beatific vision and the church suffering are fully receptive. They're receiving merits and good works that they cannot merit from us. And so we see that the structure of the church even matches the Trinitarian structure, which makes sense in light of the filioque. The human family could give even more insight on the filioque. We say that the Holy Spirit is the blossom of love or the self outpouring love of the Father and the Son. When a lover loves his beloved and the beloved loves a lover back, we see that their love is not fully harmonized as they're directed against each other. But when there's a third, the lover and the beloved can unite their love in the third and be fully united, allowing their love to come to full fruition, blooming forth a love product. In the Godhead, the Father and the Son mutually love each other in the self-outpouring love, which is the Holy Spirit, their pledge or crown of love, the flower of charity of the Father and the Son. We see a created imitation of this in the human family. The husband and wife love each other, but it comes to true fruition when the husband and wife love each other in a third, their child. Similar to how the husband and the wife love each other in the child, we hear the church fathers say the Father and the Son love each other in the Holy Spirit which makes sense in light of the filioque. Even human reproduction makes sense in light of the filioque as defined at the Council of Florence. Remember the Council of Florence say, both father and son actively spirate or produce the Holy Spirit, but the father has the spirit of power underivatively, and he communicates this numerically one spirit of power to the son. Well, when a husband and a wife produce a child, 
the husband actively communicates his seed to the wife, and the wife receives the numerically one seed of the husband. And then together, they both actively produce a child as one common principle. So while there's numerically one seed power from the husband, maintaining the monarchy of the husband, both husband and wife actively produce the child. This is a mirror of the filioque as defined at the Council of Florence. Remember, the father communicates his numerically one spirit of power to the son who receives it, yet both actively spirate or produce the Holy Spirit as one common principle. There's one spirit of power, but two persons actively spirating as one common principle. So even human reproduction points towards Florentine filioque. Objection. This is an improper carnal fleshly comparison. Reply to objection. False. God created sex. And it's a beautiful thing when done in marriage. Remember, we are not saying that the Holy Spirit is a child. And we're not trying to understand the Holy Spirit's hypostatic origin in light of reproduction. Rather, how the communication of the seed in reproduction is a reflection of the communication of the spirit of power in the production of the Holy Spirit under one aspect. Now, of course, reproduction resembles the generation of the Son under another aspect. We're not making the Holy Spirit into a child. That's not what we're doing. And no, we're not trying to explain the Holy Spirit's hypostatic origin through reproduction. Rather, we're trying to understand reproduction in light of it being an icon of the Trinity. Don't misinterpret what we're saying. So we see the filioque is beautiful because it surprisingly synthesizes truths of the soul's operations, the human family, reproduction, and the structure of the church. We have argued for the filioque by first using John 16 to show that scripture proves the filioque. Then we debunked the essence energy's real distinction and showed the biblical parallels that the son receiving authority from the father indicated hypostatic origin and that the Holy Spirit receiving authority from the Son indicates he proceeds from the Son. And we showed that the Church Fathers also used this argument. Then we also showed that the argument that the Father communicates all to the Son except paternity, the Father spirates, therefore the Son spirates, was supported by John 16 and used by many of the Church Fathers. Then we also showed that the relational model of the Trinity was in line with the Cappadocian model of the Trinity, and that if a real distinction has to be grounded on relative opposition, this means either the Holy Spirit produces the Son or the Son produces the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit does not produce the Son, therefore the Son produces the Holy Spirit. Then afterwards, we answered the common objection from John 15, 26, where it says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. We realize the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father is something both positions affirm. Then we used Revelation 22.1 and showed that Revelation 22.1 proves the filioque because the term ek pruamanon is used. Now, if you deny that ek pruamanon is about hypostatic origin, you actually undermine your basis for reading John 15.26 about hypostatic origin. And from this, you have to say that the only way to learn about the imminent trinity is through the economy, which also proves the filioque. So whether or not Revelation 21 is about the imminent trinity still forces you to a position to affirm the filioque. Then after that, we made an argument from the taxis of persons. Why is the Father the first person? Why is the Son the second person? And why is the Holy Spirit the third person? The Father is first because he's from no one. The Son is second because he's from the Father alone. And the Holy Spirit is third because he's from the Father and the Son. Filioque. Then in this video, we showed that St. Augustine, St. Hilary, St. Athanasius, St. Cyril, St. Basil, St. Ephraim, St. Epiphanius, St. Leo the Great, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Ambrose, St. Isidore, Gaul in 500 AD, the Council of Seleucia and Nicene bishops, St. Caesarius, St. Theodore, Nicaea II, St. Tarsius, the Franks, Pope Adrian, the West Syriac tradition, St. Jacob Saru, Pope St. Gregory the Great, St. Maximus Confessor, St. Gregory of Tours, St. Eucarius, St. Paulinus of Nola, St. Fulgentius, and others believed in the filioque. Then we showed how the economic trinity illuminates the imminent trinity, and we answered common objections and showed that the people who try to refute this principle actually end up supporting it, but they have to use the doctrine of appropriations. Then we showed how theosis actually points towards the filioque, how the origins of the first human family in the book of Genesis points to the filioque, and how the family structure and the fourth commandment points to the filioque, and how human reproduction, the human family, and the church structure all point to the filioque. In short, we have synthesized a cumulative case argument for the filioque, and we see that Neopalamites and Phodians cannot do the same thing, because we know that truth is a synthesis, and because they're not grounded in truth, they do not have the synthesis we do. So in short, the filioque is true. Remember, Vatican II dogmatically states in Lumen Gentium 14, Whosoever therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to remain in it, could not be saved. Therefore, become Catholic. Today, if you shall hear his voice, harden not your hearts. If there are any errors in this video, I submit to Holy Mother Church, which guides all men to the fullness of truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you like this video, pray the rosary for yourself and for my family. Do, 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 do. Do 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 do
トゥルルトゥルトゥルトゥゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥルトゥル